I think it's back on now. It says live on Facebook. Okay. We're back again. Looks like we are. All right. So if you are able to watch us, can you please send us a message so we know uh, that we are reconnected? Please. <laughs> Okay, so it's building up the numbers again. So we've got four watching. Yeah. Did you, did you send me the link again? Sure. Mm -hmm. Is it the same link or is it a new one? No, it should be a new one, Vinny. Okay. All right, so just send us a quick comment, guys, if you can hear us, if you can see us. We know you're there, so we can carry on with this special chat for you. Don't forget to send me the link, please. So. Ooh, I'm excited about this life. <laughs> no, First time. Uh, a bit nervous, a bit anxious, but uh, nothing compares to uh, being in a futsal grand final. So <laughs> this will be much easier, despite the, the nervousness and the anxiety, you know? Okay, so you should have a new link there. Yep, so, I got uh, it. So we got, at the moment, 10 people watching. Um, I hope they are the same. They stayed with us, you know, through this technical issue. But luckily we have Hannah here. He's the IT guy. So he's the, you know, the brain, he arranged all of these uh, <laughs> connections, so I'm a bit lost. Okay. Um, I hope they are the same, they stay with us, you know, through this technical issue. Ah. Are we working now? Yep, looks like we can. So, um, sure. good. Uh, so we got 10 people, that's, that's better than expected. The, guys, the, you know, the brain, he arranged all of these <laughs> hmm. Do we have a delay here or no? Connection, so I'm a bit lost. Okay. Vinny, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. I think you, you have to turn down your computer or so whatever other device you're using because I couldn't hear myself <laughs> in the background. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. So that's why I was a bit lost because I was saying something and then five seconds later I was hearing myself. So I was like, oh, okay. 13 people. Yes, we're building up the numbers. That's not, that's good. Awesome. Yeah. All right. So let me see who's here. Um, Dane Stokes. Howdy, yes. Uh, you're going to help me with that number. Ten, Tenil? Tenil, Tenil yeah. yeah. Tenil, yeah. Gabi, Guy, great coach. Uh, Talita, hi Talita. Uh, Hannah, of course. So, yeah. You got Keanu. Yeah, so we've got 16 people now. So the pressure's on, Hannah. <laughs> the pressure's on. <laughs> the, the, the pressure's on. I might need a beer during this uh, live because if we get past 20, then, I, then I'll get very nervous. <laughs> all right that's awesome okay um vinny yes i think we can go ahead now and um yep and continue we with our live we should we i think we the best way for us to to start obviously we are good friends and we have been uh, friends for now over a decade <laughs> yep. uh, so I, I just wanted to say that I'm a, that I really appreciate you um, taking the time to be with me in this slide and it's a pleasure. Um, and that we can hopefully share some light with the uh, with our viewers tonight. So um, 
Well, uh, no, no, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Yep. Uh, like, as I said, at first, I was a little bit hesitant. You know, I didn't want to do it. Don't feel comfortable. Uh, I don't mind, you know, uh, speaking in front of people. Like, you know, public speaking, it's not an issue for me. But then I'm not very good with technology, uh, even though I use the tactical pad, which is uh, one of the, the best, uh, you know, tools for futsal, for coaching. So it requires a lot of knowledge doing that. But uh, live, you know, <laughs> all these Facebook, you know, Instagram thing, it's not my, my you know, uh, my cup of tea, if, if I can say that. My mom complains about me not posting a photo, you know, for the past two years. So I have Facebook created an Instagram account. Uh, and I don't use much uh, for my personal, you know, uh, life. I try to share more uh, futsal content, but I need to start creating the habit to uh, advertising a little bit more of my work because I see so many coaches doing it and I, you know, praise them, but they also ask me to do that. So I need to develop and uh, create first and then develop that habit into uh, sharing some of my, um, you know, life experiences as a, as a person, you know, and as a coach. Absolutely. Totally agree. Um, we'll get <laughs> so Vinny, how, why don't you just um, start by telling us a little bit about yourself and, you know, where you're from, how old you are, um, which futsal and, and football clubs um, you have played for, uh, both in Brazil and Australia, so we, we can get our conversation started. Yeah. So I come from Brazil, like obviously, so people who um, you know, spot the English mistakes. So for those uh, people that speak English, the Aussies especially, apologies for any mistakes uh, I make during this uh, live. Uh, I'll try my best, okay, as I always do, but mistakes are going to happen and they're part of life. So I come from a city called Belo Horizonte. It's the third biggest city in Brazil. So you have the first one being Sao Paulo, second Rio, third Belo Horizonte. Uh, just a curious fact for you guys, uh, we are known as the uh, pub capital of Brazil. So we are not on the coast and then uh, we have the most pubs in Brazil. So it's not, a, it's not good for an aspiring football or futsal player because, you know, they can get involved with drinking because there's so many options, but I kept my focus. So just, just a cu curious fact for you guys. So Belo Horizonte, uh, as I said, third biggest city. Uh, there's a lot of football and futsal clubs over there. And uh uh, I'm 30, 35 years old, so in a month's time, I'll be 36, 18th of May. Uh, and I started playing futsal, got involved in futsal when I was seven. So I used to play uh, at school, you know, at a younger age, but then I joined the futsal academy at the age of seven. And then my journey started there. So, you know, let's say 28 years ago that I've been uh, involved in futsal. I never played football uh, back in Brazil. Uh, played a little bit here in Australia. We're going to talk about that. But uh, futsal has always been my passion uh, and will always be my passion. You know? Very good. Very good. And, uh, and Clubs. Yeah. Is that the next question? Uh, the clubs that I've played for uh, yep. in Brazil. Uh, so I played futsal. As I said, at the age of seven, I joined um, a club called Clube Atlético Mineiro. For the Brazilians, they, they know... Uh, this club. Uh, at that time, it was the, the powerhouse of futsal. They had Falcão, Manuel Tobias, Lenizio, Vinicius, Neto. So they're all uh, youth players, you know, they are like just before the senior team. And then I, I used to be four or five years younger than them. So I always watching them. So my training session finished before theirs. And then I was staying there two hours later to watch them train. And then the senior team had Falcão, you know, uh, Eule, Inju, uh, Renato, the, you know, the big keeper. So it was, it was always a dream. And I put in my head that I wanted to become a professional player. So I joined Atletico, stayed pretty much most of my career playing for that club till the age of, I think, 20, 22, 21, I would say. Uh, and then I decided to also study, you know, get involved in uh, uni because there's so many players in Brazil. Sometimes it gets really hard despite having talent gets really hard to become a professional player. So I always had in my mind that if I didn't become a professional player, I always wanted to be involved in futsal. Uh, and the way I could do that was through studying and then becoming a coach or a personal trainer, you know, uh, like uh, physio, some, something related to futsal. Uh, and then I combined, you know, I juggled training with uh, studying and it was pretty 
pretty hard, but I managed to do that. So uh, from Atletico Mineiro, I joined a club called Oasis. So my uni teacher, after joining uni, he started this project saying, okay, there's a lot of players that did not make it to the top level or did make it and wanted to continue uh, playing after they, they started you know, their studies. And then he put together a team. So it was a gun team because a lot of players, professional players that didn't have an opportunity like I had, like, like I didn't have, sorry, to continue after that. Uh, he put a, this team together and then we started playing. We came second in the regional league. We went to state cup and we did really well. Uh, we didn't have any uh, wages because, you know, it was just like a, a, a uni project, I would say. But then we represented the uni in several tournaments and that gave us the scholarship. So that made me more attached to the uni. Then after that, I joined America. So America is another club, America Mineiro. They um, had a project as well. They started pretty strong. Then we had wages. So they started paying us. So I stayed in this program, as I said, Oasis for about two years. And then that opened the eyes of this club, America, and said, okay, we want a few players of this uni project and then put a, a team together. So we played Taça Brasil, uh, Metropolitano, the State Cup. So I started like, it, it, it was kind of like a restart, you know, to my career. So from the age of 21 to 23, 24, there was mainly a uni. And then 23 to 25, I joined this club, America, had a great time there. We played against Falcão uh, in the Taça Brasil, and then we lost, like, I think it was 9-1, but it was just amazing to play against him. Uh, and uh, it's a moment that I'll never forget, you know, I'll take it with me for the rest of my life. And then at the, age of, at the age of 25, I came to Australia. So pretty much just a sum up of what, of what my journey in futsal has been so far. Uh, from America to Oasis, Oasis to, sorry, from Atletico to Oasis, Oasis to America, America to Australia. And here I am today. Very sorry good. for talking too much. <laughs> <laughs> no, that is a very comprehensive answer, Vinny, so thank you for that. Um, I just wanted to um, take the opportunity to say hi to those joining us now. I know that um, a lot of people don't join from the start. They, they come as as we progress into the, the broadcast. So I just wanted to say hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Coach Hannon Fenwick, uh, for those who don't know me, and we are here today, or tonight, should I say, <laughs> with um, Vinny Lecce. Vinny is the Just Futsal New South Wales head coach, and he's also the national coach for the men's team in Solomon Island. So um, I'm having the, yeah, yeah that's it. I'm having the pleasure to, to talk with my great friend Vinny. We, um, we go back um, over a decade um, when we first started in Brisbane in 2009 or 10. 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. I came a little bit before you, but then you arrived and we, we quickly got to know each other. Um, our futsal path, paths crossed. <laughs> um, Luckily they crossed. Just so we can make this a little bit more interactive, guys, I know we have um, a few people watching there. Can you just um, put in the comments there uh, where you're watching this from? So are you in Brisbane, Gold Coast, Melbourne? Are you not in Australia? Where are you right now? Just um, just send us a, a quick message in the comments. Um, Hi, Josh. We Josh just Hi. joined us. Dane, Dane just you know, message saying, I use the word uh, gesticulate, so I still have trouble, you know, pronouncing it. But yeah, we went to so Hawaii, and uh, I don't know when I used that, you know, word. But he's saying is a is a diff difficult, not difficult, but um, different word. You know, people don't pronounce that very often. So he's saying yeah. my English is is good. So thank you, Dane. Mm -hmm. You so you'll be joining us us next year again in Hawaii just because of that comment. Okay. <laughs> So um, looks like we have um, we have people in in so West Brisbane, Australia, Coffs Harbour, and Guy's watching us from Western Australia, and, and yeah. So Howard, so yeah. thanks for for being part of today tonight's um, live session with us, guys. We really appreciate it. So we're going to we're going to continue on now. Um, to have a bit of a chat here. And I just wanted to, to ask Vinny uh, how, you, how you got involved with futsal in Australia. Uh, last week, I shared a little bit of um, my story with our viewers. 
um, of how it started and, and you know, um, I just wanted to, mm-hmm. I was curious to, to know how you got involved with futsal in Australia in the first place. Yep. Um, I know we had our first contact um, in Acacia Reed in, in, in Brisbane at the time uh, at a school holiday clinic, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. And that was the first time we saw each other and uh, worked together. Yep. So, and, and also if you can comment uh, um, in, a, in a more succinct way, um, what your thoughts are of um, the sport of futsal in Australia at present. Yep. Okay. So my involvement in futsal after arriving in 2010, when I was 25 years old, at the age of 25. Um, well, as soon as I arrived in Brisbane, initially, there was not many opportunities to play futsal. Uh, there was one or two, you know, like small leagues and I didn't have the opportunity to play. But then Filippi uh, and Igor, they, um, I met them through football. So they invited me to join a futsal tournament. I think it was Champions of Champions that AFA uh, ran that tournament. And then we played, unfortunately, we lost in the final. And from that moment on, playing that tournament, I got to know a lot of people that were uh, involved in futsal. As I said, Felipe Amorin, he was, you know, he's a legend here. So he knows everybody, everybody knows him. So then I got a little bit more involved with him. And then Igor knew uh, Guilherme Costa. So he's in uh, Melbourne now and he was working for AFA. So uh, they invited me to go to an, uh, like a school holiday camp, as you previously mentioned. Uh, and I was excited about it, but I was very nervous because I could not speak English. So <laughs> I had just arrived in Australia, maybe like four months after I arrived. And I was living in a house uh, with five, four Brazilians. So we're mainly speaking Portuguese uh, every day. So I was coming back from the, the English school and then arriving at home, just Portuguese. So it was hard for me to memorize, you know, and perfect my English and develop and learn a bit more. So they invited me to go to this holiday uh, camp, you know, school holiday camp. And then I went because I needed the money as well. Uh, And then when I got there, I found a way to uh, coach the kids. So I could not communicate past the message on, but I uh, used demonstrations, you know. So I set up so the drills and then the only thing I could say was follow me. So I went, I went through the drill with them and then they were, okay, I understand that. So all I used was gestures, you know, uh, nonverbal communication with them. And then they um, actually did quite well. They got the message. And then I asked them, you know, in a way, say, you guys uh, name this, this drill. So they were explain, explaining the drill as they went through it. And then I started to memorize, okay, so that's what they say, waving through the cones, sprinting. So things that uh, may be silly now in all these words that I have absorbed and learned. But at that time, it was just so hard. So the clinic went for about two days, Saturday and Sunday. Uh, I think it was six hours a day, three in the morning, three in the afternoon. And then I got to know Guy a little bit more. And then you, had it. So you're coaching on the other court there. And I was just like amazed you just like fluent English, talking to the kids, explaining the activity. And I think I've told you that I looked at you and then I was like, wow, this guy is amazing. You know, like <laughs> his English. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm being honest. I was like, this guy is amazing. His English is amazing. One day I want to speak, you know. Uh, and like and can I tell you what I felt? Nope. Yeah, you can, but I don't know. <laughs> I'll, I'll, just, I'll just say this now, and obviously, thank you so much for the kind words. Um, yeah. But also, also when, when I saw you the first time, and I must confess, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't even expecting you um, to speak awesome English because you, you had been in the country for very little time, so not, not long at all. Four, four months, um, yeah. But when I saw your training session when i saw your training session even with no limited english. english uh i thought my god this guy has got some great potential and look at this training session all the kids are involved so running and participating um it was uh, we we joked uh, at the time it was a an o- organized mess <laughs> 
So it they're was... all moving. They all had a boyfriend of their feet. And, um, you know, you, you somehow managed with little English and all your, your gestures, your body language um, to, to pass the message on. So uh, that was the first time that you captured my attention and my admiration. So thank you. Just wanted to, to share that with everybody. No, no, thank you. And as I said, so then uh, the cool down like exercise was, uh, you know, both groups together. So my group and your group. And then I remember coming to you, you know, it's coming up to you and say, okay, can you please help me with this cool down thing? Cause I don't know what that means. And you go, so just leave with me. So you ran that beautifully and I was just watching you observing, learning. Uh, and that's what I do, you know, uh, I still do. I'm still learning, you know, even coaching the kids. So nowadays and uh, watching other coaches, online videos. So we can never stop learning. So I started learning uh, on that day from you and uh, I'm very grateful because you're very kind. So you could have seen me as a competition or there's a new coach here, he might take my spot. So I'm not gonna help him. So you could have, you know, uh, gone that way, but you didn't. So you're very humble, very generous, uh, very friendly. So you helped me and you guided me through the next day as well. Cause that was the first day, uh, actually the first morning. So we had one group in the morning, then another group in the afternoon. So that was the first three hours, you know, I was that nervous. But then you made things so much easier for the afternoon session of the, of the first day. And then therefore the second day was much easier. So that was my contact with futsal first time. So as you said, I, I think I did a good job. I couldn't have done much better, but I knew of my limitations. And then from that moment on, uh, I uh, got to know Philippe a little bit better and more opportunities, you know, uh, appeared for me to coach. Uh, and then, so we're going to get to that stage. I don't want to, you know, uh, just rush things here. But yeah, that was my first involvement was uh, in a school holiday camp for AFA in Brisbane as was when I was living there. Very good, very good. And uh, it was well pointed out. Um, I never saw you um, as a competition. I, and I never- Some will. coaches do, some, some coaches do, but that's what I said. You're very generous, very humble, very friendly. Other coaches might feel threatened about a new coach arriving. I might lose my spot, but you never did that. No, no, like uh, obviously, um, as I said before, our friendship goes a long way. Um, yeah. And um, I don't think it's it would be the right thing to do. Um, I know I know there's a lot of um, a, lo a lot of that happening out there. Uh, but um, you you did say and, and said well one day that we we need to build bridges, yeah, not walls, not walls, bridges. Um, so the only way we will we will continue. Um, to do our very best, but the only way that futsal will grow in Australia, and I'm sure um, that our viewers can relate to that, is if we work together. So if you're watching this, guys, uh, I'll just saw a little bit of inter interaction with us. Um, can you just um, click on that heart button there if you agree that futsal can only grow in Australia if we work together? So I just wanna see you showing your love to us do us a favor and, and click on that little heart button there, just so we know that um, we are talking the same here. So, and, um, and, and obviously since 2010, Vinny, yep. um, Futsal in Australia, oh, I can see the hearts coming up now. So well done. Thanks everybody. We're just on. two seconds. I just want to say hi to Jamie, legend. Uh, I miss you as well, man. One day we'll play together or I'll be able to coach you, okay? Uh, I think George <laughs> is watching as well. Uh, George, Armando, be careful. George is watching, so I can't so reveal the just foot of secrets. Gold Coast is already, you know, a winning team, so you, you don't need any more secrets because otherwise you guys are going to be more uh, unbeatable. I'm joking, George. <laughs> thank you for watching. Armando as well. Uh, Armando Kakachi, thank you. A uh, great friend and a great person as well. Has helped me a lot. Uh, and has supported me uh, over these years. So thank you, guys. Yeah. Sorry, I interrupted you, Hannah. No, it's 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 all right. Just yeah, it's really good to have them, and and the audience the audience is growing. So uh, welcome to to those um, joining us now. We're just here having a bit of a chat about futsal and and everything else. Um, so back in 2010, um, you know, between now and then, it's been like a decade. And um, what are your thoughts, Vinny? Um, and I think we, we think very similar um, to the way that futsal is being run in Australia. 
and what sort of potential it has and where, where it can go, depending on you know, what we said before, how we can work together. Um, so what's your view in general um, of, you know, about futsal in Australia? Yeah, so now it is a subject that I, you know, love talking about. So initially we're just introducing ourselves, telling a little bit about our story, our involvement in futsal, but now let's talk uh, business, yes. Uh, I think I see futsal in Australia uh, with a huge, huge potential, uh, not just because uh, the, the players, the level of the players, the quality of the players are very high, but financially they can afford to go to tournaments. It's much different than where we come from. So sometimes the talented kid never gets the opportunity to go and play in tournaments if the club doesn't fund to the trip. In Australia, it's the other way around. The kid might not be that great uh, as a player. He has talent, but it's not an amazing player. And then he can afford it. So as I said, there's a huge potential. But as you mentioned before, uh, clubs affiliation, uh, yeah, like affiliations, associations, you know, federations, they are building walls around them. So they're building their fortresses and keeping their players inside there. And then they live in their own little world, but they're forgetting to build bridges, okay? Because uh, if, you, if you just build walls, one day you're going to be uh, surrounded by, you know, uh, those walls and you're not going to be able to get out. They might be too high, they might be too thick. And you're going to be immersed in that little world there. And then that's going to be called the, uh, the big fish in a tank full of shark. So, um, the, sorry, so the small fish in a tank full of shark. So you, you can be the, the king of your own kingdom, but uh, the, the world is so much bigger than that. And that's what happens here. We'll, we'll talk about that. There's like four or five different federations, futsal federations in Australia. And that's yeah. ruining the, so the sport. So we'll never get anywhere if we don't unite, okay? And I think I just wanted to um, obviously um, compliment what you said, um, because I, men I mentioned it in my, my live broadcast um, last week, um, that a lot of people um, involved with futsal um, these days, unfortunately, um, don't know if you agree with me, unfortunately, they, uh, they put in their egos first they there's there's so much politics um as you mentioned with the different associations and organizations and this and that uh obviously you know we're doing uh what we can with what we have where you are where we are um mm. so and you know uh, once we can obviously it's hard because we're all human beings uh, so we have to um keep mining ourselves with our egos and, and trying to keep away from, from the politics involved because simply because the, the, the benefit, the, the end product of what we're offering, it's, it's for the kids. You know, the kids will benefit everything we do. It's the kids, the families. Um, it's for them. It's, it's for it's, them. It's for them and not for us. So we are just facilitators um, and, you know, obviously – if they if they can work together and put aside their egos and put aside the the politics, even even if it's just a little bit, um, would you agree that futsal will start moving forward um, in Australia a little bit quicker? Yes, definitely. But as you mentioned and like I highlighted perfectly, uh, is a is a battle of egos, but most importantly, uh, it's a it's a it's a game of thrones. Okay, making like a reference. To the tv series so it's a game of thrones because you have four or five federations sitting on those thrones in their own kingdoms as i said they're kings of their own kingdom mm -hmm. uh, and they somebody will have to give in yes but the question is who's going to give in so we can start uniting uh those affiliations federations like organizations you know clubs somebody will have to give in and that will hurt their ego uh their uh pride and then they might not want to do that. And that's, that's the, the current scenario Futsal is in, is because people don't want to give in because the other will get more than I have, you know, and I, it took me so many years to build what I have. Why would I give everything I've got to this, you know, like organizations or affiliation or club? So it's, it becomes uh, a much bigger problem then it should be because people now have 
I'll mention that you know quite often have built their empire and then they don't want uh, to have another person or another king take over. You know? yeah. If I can you know make a reference to that. So mm-hmm. you got your empire, you're you're like running it, you know, you'd want a, another king to sit on your throne. That will yeah. hurt you. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Great answer, Vinny. Um, obviously, it's a, it's a much bigger issue and we could probably do a, a live just on that subject <laughs> and talk, it for, for our, talk about that for hours. Uh, but I think we can, we can probably move into um, our ne- next topic. You happy to do that? Yeah, I'm just uh, reading a message here from Tim. Yeah, hi, Tim. So I completely agree with you. So all leagues and federations combined. But, you know, as I said before, somebody have to give in. And who's going to start doing that? I think if, if one, you know, uh, big federation uh, leads the way to say, okay, so let's so unite. Or you have four or five, but if two you know, join forces, they'll become stronger than the other three. And then it's much easier for one more to join them. They'll become even stronger and then they'll suffocate the other two. And then that's, you know, how you, so unite all of us, but it has to start with someone, you know, like somebody or some club or some uh, like affiliation. And the question is that I ask everybody that's watching, uh, it's who's going to start doing that. Uh, I can name them here, but it's not, the purpose of this video but uh the people that are involved in futsal they they know who they are so you have one in melbourne you know ffa we can mention that but then you have afa and then you have uh faf which is tony which by the way does a great job starting to do a great job for the kids for the players for the families not just for himself but he's even pride but the other two mm-hmm. yeah so people in melbourne like oh okay i'll mention that like peter from futsal laws doesn't excellent job like he has built an empire but uh uh he has built so what's the word um that i'm it's just it's just not not in my head now but he has built like a community you know like a family futsal family there and it's great i wish i could have that here but uh the format i disagree a little bit with the small court format you know he needs should have moved to a bigger format and to draw more players but that's what he likes to do. That's in working for him. It's getting more players, uh, more clubs, more teams joining in, and it's working. But it starts with FFA. You know, they demand us to join them. They demand us to affiliate to them. But what do they offer? You know, I can start talking about that now. But let let's save it for later. You know, yeah, food absolutely. for thought. So people will join us. You know, they'll get yeah. excited about this conversation. So I'll save it for later. But <laughs> I'm actually like salivating to talk about that. Because I've got so much, so much to talk about. I already talk too much and people know that, but uh, when, when, when I talk about a subject that I'm passionate, you know, about, uh, then it becomes more, um, so what's the word, <laughs> uh, more uh, enjoyable, you know, for, for me to talk about it because I love it. I love it. And uh, I have a lot of experience, you know, in, in these 10 years here, I've seen a lot, I've done a lot. I've met so many people with different opinions, so I can uh, share a little bit of their opinions. I'm not going to mention names, but I can share the yep. opinions so people can agree or disagree with that. Absolutely. We, we're all entitled to have our opinions. Yep. Uh, and um, as you said, they do a great job. And um, if, you know, um, thanks, for the, thanks for the question, by the way, Tim. Uh, yep. Great question. And, and not only that, um, Vinny, that was my dream from day one in here was why has this like never happened? Like why can't they just sit down, have a meeting, you know, put things on the table and discuss and come to an agreement. And obviously that would have to be compromised, you know, um, so from all parts and, and obviously that, um, you know, would benefit the sport. And then again, the I can answer that question. Yeah. <laughs> I can answer that question quite easily. Why hasn't this happened, you know, before? Because first, it's going to hurt somebody's ego. Uh, second, uh, it's going to hurt their pride as well. But third and most importantly, I think in my opinion, it's going to hurt them financially. Yes. So if you give in, you're going to lose pretty much more than 50%, if not more, of your income because you're going to have to pay affiliation to other people. You have to follow their rules, you know, uh, be under their 
uh, I would say, guidance, I would say. So they will dictate what you have to do. So it's not just the ego, the pride, okay. but yeah. financially, the damage will be, will be much more. I think people are willing to maybe hurt their egos, their pride, if they can keep the financial side of it. Uh, but when, when you know, it, it touches your pocket, so people go, nah. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah, it's, it's true. Uh, people can yeah. disagree or not, but I think I'm being honest here. Uh, and once that happens, you know, if it touches your pocket, no. So people are not going to do uh, that. They are already doing fine without being associated with any other, you know, like organization. So why join and lose money if I'm doing so well the way I am? So that's how mm. I see it. Mm. Yep. Uh, I agree with you. Alex Argolo is commenting there, Vinny, um, one of the best places to develop futsal. Uh, perfect facilities, great coaches. Um, all the environment and culture re related to sports development. So I totally agree with you. I can, can relate to that. And um, we, we truly believe that um, there's a lot of potential to be developed, to be explored, to be worked with here, um, starting from, you know, kids as young as three years old. So once yeah. they, they can get involved with, with the sport and, and progress and create the passion, we can, you know, continue to to build build that culture and and mm. and and obviously the kids develop that love for the sport and then um one day maybe we'll still be alive in it one day <laughs> hopefully we'll hopefully i'm happen. still in australia i just want to say hi Jaden. Uh, hi mick uh, petrea sorry if i pronounce your your name uh, wrong mm -hmm. chantel rono um or hono caleb and ben Thank you for watching, guys. We got 28 people, an average of you know between 22 and 30. So that's actually more than expected. Yeah. Thank, you so bit, Thank you so much. Thank you so much for staying with us. us. <laughs> um, a little bit more pressure on us. Um, okay, let's um, talk about the the work we do um, in the region here. So countryside, regional area. Um, a lot of people have probably asked you the same question that they asked me. Um, why <laughs> are you there? Um, how how did it happen? Um, so, if, where where are you based, Vinny? And can you tell us a little bit about the programs that you offer there? Um, academies, competitions. What's your your um, main work there, and where are you based? Yeah. Uh, well, I'm based in the Lismo area, so more precisely in Ganelaba. So we started with the Austinville uh, Futsal Club, working for Fine North Coast Futsal. Uh, that was in 2010, just going back a little bit. Uh, when I got involved in futsal in Brisbane, then I got offered a, a position, you know, a job here uh, in the Fine North Coast area. I didn't hesitate, because it was my dream to work with futsal. So I came uh, to a complete unknown area uh, with limited English, uh, but then my former bosses, you know, embraced me and uh, took me in, gave me a home, gave me uh, a family that I didn't have here because I was just here like, like on my own. And uh, that, that's how I started here. So I moved to the region in 2010 to Austinville. And then since then, we, you know, fast forward 10 years, I'd say, we've got three centers now. We've got Ganelaba Sports and Aquatic Center is an amazing facility. Uh, we... Uh, secure the Kevin Bar Center in Byron Bay. So we also operate futsal over there. And we last year uh, opened up a new club in the Ballina region to attend you know, the people of that area. So we've got three centers now, the three biggest centers in the region. Uh, futsal, you know, just futsal is there running futsal. So we uh, are the leading futsal provider in the region. So once again, Canalaba, Byron Bay and Ballina. So we are like, uh, building our empire here, but also we're building bridges, not walls. Okay, we're not surrounding ourselves with our ego and pride. Uh, we want and, the best. We want. And the I best guess I guess that goes um, that goes and builds a bridge with us here. Yeah, and Where the bridge goes and the bridge goes further. It goes to Port Macquarie with Mick Day over there, exactly. and it goes the other way. Uh, you know, uh, with Galaxy. You know, in the Brisbane clubs there. Uh, we want to, you know, work with the Melbourne clubs and Sydney. So that, that partnership, I'll talk about that as well. So I've been trying to build bridges uh, as, a, as a player because my career in Australia started as a 
a player slash coach. I would say 70% player, 30% coach. Now tables have turned. So I'm all like an 80% coach and 20% player. So that, that's the, that's how uh, futsal has evolved, has evolved apologies in the area. Uh, there are not many opportunities to play anymore, but the coaching opportunities uh, have gotten bigger, you know? So that's why I'm dedicating more of my time as a coach than as a player. Uh, loving it, but I'm also missing playing, uh, playing foot. So I had a few injuries, you know, and I'm just, so I had a son that took a lot of my time as a player, could not travel, uh, but I'll get back into it. I'm training now and the boys I went to, so Hawaii, uh, we're going to go there next year and I'll be playing, coaching and playing. <laughs> yeah, it sure, it sure does. Uh, Guy Carniel, it, the bridge goes all the way to Western Australia. So um, it, oh, is, yeah. it is a big bridge. And um, yeah, we there is no limit for our bridge really, is there? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, yeah. So we want to, uh, you know, partner with as many clubs, as many people first, and then people that are involved in clubs or clubs, you know, uh, in general, to offer the best pathways for the kids. I forgot to mention one thing that you asked me how I see futsal in Australia. I forgot to mention that and I actually had so written it down. It's completely divided, yes? So players, parents have no direction, no pathway. They don't know when they play for this organization if they're gonna go that way. I received so many calls from parents saying, Vinny, what's this? So I've received a letter to go to Italy or to go to this place, you know, $6,000, $8,000. Should I do it? Should I not do it? So what's involved, you know, uh, is there a professional pathway for my son or daughter? So then I had to explain it to them. So it should never be that way. It should, should have one federation running food. So uh, with one pathway, uh, but we know that, that, that that's a dream. And hopefully we, one day that dream is going to come true, but, uh, going back to what I said, it's completely divided. There's no direction, no pathway. If a player wants to pursue a career in futsal, there's not even a national league anymore. Uh, and how can you get exposure as a player or get exposed as a player so an international and overseas club can see you if you can't play domestically? You know, uh, you, some people do great jobs, you know, in Brisbane, Felipe, then you have um, L in Perth, and then you have. Um, Peter in Melbourne, and then you have in Sydney uh, some the Premier League that runs for 10 weeks only, so it's not enough because everybody plays football, so you don't want to clash with that. We're going to talk about that as well. So as I said, it's completely divided, is a mess, and it, it takes a lot of work to fix it, to unite first, and then once united, to lead them to the right uh, path. Uh, but yeah. One, one day, one day that's going to happen. And I can't wait for that day. As, as you said, hopefully I'm still alive. My son, when he's like, you know, 20, maybe he'll be able to play uh, in a national league, which is pretty sad. He was quite good and enjoyed playing it. There was a pathway. It doesn't exist anymore. Mm. The question is why? Why did it stop? Why did it finish? Yeah. Can somebody answer that? Because mm. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Put in the comments there if you're watching and if you have the answer for that, we'd love to hear your opinion. Um, Vinny, you, you do have um, a futsal academy uh, with Just Futsal there based in, in Gunella, but and this year you started in Byron Bay too, which is great. Um, so it, it's, I was going to start, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it's similar. Uh, it's a very similar program to what we offer here in our region too, in McLean, Grafton, in Coffs Harbour. Um, so can you tell a little bit, uh, a little bit more about the high performance or your uh, futsal academy program. What 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 do you normally do? Just as in, in the sum up, um, yeah. and and we can develop the conversation there. Yeah, of course. So we have an academy program here uh, in the you know Lismore area, Ganelba, Byron. Uh, we concentrate mainly our trainings in Ganelba because it was the first facility we secured. Uh, initially, as I said, going back you know many years. We started in Austinville and it was funny. Uh, I'll quickly, I'll briefly mention that we started training once a month. Yeah. For the people that are part of the academy now, the Just Futsal Academy, we're training twice a week. Some people train once due to other commitments, others train twice, but that's weekly. But before it was once a month on a Sunday. So people used to come to Austinville once a month for an hour training session. Yeah. And then I would see them four weeks later. Uh, 
when I arrived here, I told my boss, now I want to do three nights, you know, an hour and a half or two hours if I can. She goes, uh, get off your horse. Like, no, don't, <laughs> it's not going to happen. I go, okay. So that was a, you know, uh, cold blanket that she threw on me. And I was like, okay, so what can we do? She goes, you're lucky to get once a month. And I go, okay, so let's try with that. Then over the years, we developed a good program. So people enjoyed it. They wanted more. They asked for more. So we had to offer more. Then that became fortnightly and then eventually became once a week and then in for three years when i started just futsal i started training twice a week so i go we need to train twice a week if we want to start uh, to achieve results yes because initially we're going to go coast you know tournaments in brisbane we're getting smashed yes but we needed to go to offer the pathway despite the results being negative we needed to offer the pathways yes and like I'm a coach that in the junior level, I, as much as I want to win and I come from Brazil, you know, second place means nothing in Brazil. As much as I love, you know, winning and winning is very important. Uh, before that, you need to offer the pathways. Yes. So how can you win if you don't play? So first you play and then if you do well, the results are going to come your way. If you don't, at least you get exposure. Then you come back and say, great, these are our weak areas. This is what we need to work. This is what we need to work on. We need improvement on these aspects of our game. So the exposure is very important. And that's what we did. So we used to lose by two, like double digits, you know, 25 to one. We're lucky to score a goal and we celebrated that goal. But then uh, over the years, you know, with two nights a week, I became better as a coach as well the the english you know improved so i was able to pass the message on more efficiently you know uh so the players were assimilating the the, the training session the content and therefore they were performing uh in a much quicker pace uh and then we slowly started achieving results so when we our, our goal was to lose by one digit yeah so we went from 20 to 15 13 and then when we got to like nine, two, we go, great. So something's happening here. Uh, we, we are like on the right track. So let's keep doing that. Then more players started, you know, liking futsal. And then we improved the quality of our squad. So that's what we do here now. We got two nights a week, Monday and Tuesdays. We opened up in Byron Bay this year. We almost had between the uh, 11th, 12th and 13th and 14th, 15th, 16th, almost 28 players that wanted to uh, do futsal. That's extra on top of the 70 we had here in Ganelaba. So, so we so we're good. looking at 100 players in uh, in a, our futsal academy. And I must mention that that runs through winter. Yes. So not just, uh, we're not a summer club. Just futsal yeah. is, is, is a serious futsal academy that runs a professional program. Uh, and we, we do it for the development of the kids, yes? So put the ego and the pride aside, you know, as a coach, I want them to go and get exposure. Of course, if you start losing, you go, great, something's not working, then you have to come back to training and uh, work harder. But first is the exposure, as I, as I mentioned. Uh, then we are very lucky, he's watching us, but we're very lucky to uh, implement a strength and conditioning program, yes? So Initially, I was training was just me. I was just coaching. I was doing the warm up. I was doing the strength and conditioning coach if I could do it, if I had the time, because the session was very short, so I couldn't never do it. Uh, and then in 2017, um, we got. I met Alex Argolo, great person, great you know uh, professional. And then I invited him to join us. And then since then, our academy has changed completely. Yeah. So now we offer what the professional futsal clubs offer. Okay, and I'll, I'll say, uh, people will probably disagree. Nobody in Australia has the program we have. Yeah, I'm not talking about my quality of coaching, no, training, no. The, the methodology we have, you know, our session goes for an hour and a half, 30 minutes with Alex, you know, he got the blaze pods, the traction belts, all his knowledge, you know, the bends, the movement and preparation, what the professional players do before their sessions, we're doing with the kids because that's their dream. They want to become professional players. They need to start getting into that routine, not with the pressure the players have on, but the routine so they can uh, adapt as quickly as possible and uh, understand what they are, you know, what to expect when they become professional players. So Alex does the first 30 minutes of our program and then I do the other hour. So divided in two blocks of 30 minutes, 30 minutes, the technical and tactical work, you know, 
uh, and then the last 30 minutes is a game. So we called a condition game. So game with conditions. They never play a game just for the sake of five against five. There's always a rule, you know, uh, two touches, first time finish. You can't pass the ball back to the same player that passed you. So, you know, they got to run, make runs, free up make space. Uh, yeah, make it very dynamic. Players are holding a ball in their hands. So they play with the ball in the hands, can't, you know, receive the ball. So they got to stay connected, form the triangles. So we're always stimulating the players to think. Okay, because that's the biggest problem uh, with football slash futsal in Australia. You know, the coaches are creating robots, so they're not that's letting right. Play. Yeah, we, they're not we, letting the players we help be them. Clear. We help them to, depending on obviously the the level of um, natural talent that they already have, but mm. we help them pretty much to read the game and start to think about their decisions, and yeah. hopefully one day they they go even further and start not just thinking, but thinking ahead. Well, we let, we let them think for themselves, you know, make the, the right decisions. You just introduce uh, the, the, the way you want them to play, okay, in an organized manner, but then you can't take away sort the creativity. And that's what the, my opinion, most of the football clubs are doing in Australia. They're creating very, uh, you know, efficient robots, but they can only play a certain style. And then if you, come up against a good side that you know is able to adapt to your style of play and that's the only thing you can do no matter how good you think you are you're going to start losing and that happens to our academy so many times many you know especially in the Craig Foster the former Craig Foster Cup but the Gold Coast International Cup now our juniors we're not in the same level as the the clubs from Sydney or even from Perth you know or Melbourne but somehow we managed to beat some of the you know top clubs because they don't understand the game. They play yeah. football on a futsal court. You know, uh, the players pass back and then they hold back. They value possession a lot, and when they have a, a chance to you know turn and shoot, so they they forget about the the simple and the obvious, which is score a goal. The player receives the ball, it's in front of the goal. Instead of quickly turn and shoot, you know, plays back and then he moves away. You know, peels off and then keep possession. Hang on, like. Three seconds later, you couldn't have scored the goal, but you know you're playing beautifully. So they're losing the purpose of the game because they want to impress the coach or they want to value possession. But possession without purpose is nothing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Vinny, we have a question from Tanu here. Um, yeah. I have the the pleasure. I have the pleasure to coach um, Tanu's kids here in McLean Graf, and they are just awesome. Abby and Riley, if you're watching this, um, hi. <laughs> we love you. Uh, and they played for you as well um, in Gold Coast. Is that Abby? Abby Dolan and Riley yeah. Dolan, yeah. So Neil's asking about the girls playing futsal, and I'm sure we have other coaches there. Um, we're not, um, unfortunately, not yet uh, very big with girls' participation in our futsal academies, uh, but she's suggesting that we join forces to play in, in bigger comps uh, like the Gold Coast International and the Johnny Warren there in Gold Coast um, to get our girls to, to, to play in a girls only team would be a, a very good thing uh, and I agree with you Tanil, I think um, girls um, you know, whenever possible should be playing with girls uh, but obviously you know, as we said before we're building a culture, the participation in futsal uh, by girls especially where we are in, in regional areas isn't very big, uh, but surely um, I can talk to Vinny after this and see. Uh, obviously, we need to know when we will be able to get back on the sidelines. Yeah. Um, but um, there's always a, a possibility, and we always consider joining forces not only for girls but for uh, every possibility and every competition that we may have um, athletes for. We have done it before, you know, in Melbourne. Uh, yeah. I remember Futsal Laws Nationals uh, under 16s, I think. You only had four players or five. I only had four or five as well. And then it wasn't enough for me to send the team. It wasn't enough for you to send the team as well. So I just jumped on the phone and we, you know, spoke to each other and said, yeah, let's join forces. The players agreed. Uh, and then we went to Melbourne. It was just a little bit hard. So you had two different groups, okay, two different styles. Uh, but, you know, throughout the tournament, I think they enjoyed because it goes back to what I said initially, is the exposure. You know, they couldn't have stayed at home and going, oh, you know, watching the games and thinking, oh, if I played, I could have, you know, maybe gone to the final or maybe gained more experience. But we got the exposure. You know, we took them there despite the results didn't come our way. I think we had one or two wins, you know, out of six games. 
but it wasn't enough to get us through to the you know next stage, the quarterfinals or semis. But we got exposure, and I think it's you know the the memories is the the most they they they'll take from these tournaments. They're still very young in Australia, not many opportunities, so they need the exposure to uh, collect as many memories as they can. So when they you know grow up and grow old, they can always you know. Uh, share those moments with their kids or their relatives or their friends. You know, I do that. You know, I sit on my couch with my son sleeping on my lap. And then, you know, I play those movies when I was playing back in Brazil or the opportunities uh, I had in my life, whether I won or I lost. But yeah. uh, th th this is what you take the most. You know, you're talking as a professional player. Yes, you need results. As juniors, you need results for your ego to uh, keep the motivation, the passion, but most importantly, the, the memories. That's, that's what they will take for the rest of their lives. Just wanted to quickly mention here, Vinny, Mick, <laughs> Mick Dave from Port Macquarie just suggested North Coast, just put on East Coast together. Yes, yes, and yes, we would love that. Uh, mates, your girls are awesome. We would be thrilled to one day um, be sending our girls to play with yours. So I need to learn from you, Nick. Like, yeah. we need to know what your secret is, you know. The, the mixed Bible, somebody mentioned that to me in America when we were sitting by the <laughs> pool there. Somebody said that, you know, Mick has a, a futsal Bible. You know, so many training sessions are like more than 300. Yep. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> if, if you can share that Bible with us, that would be amazing. So we can learn, uh, you know, from you. I just want to mention here, Lily May, she's uh, Hunter's sister. Hunter is one of my players, one of the best players I have in my academy. Uh, his ability to make decisions, you know, to read the game, it's unbelievable. So she's saying I'm a true inspiration. Uh, well, I'm inspired by the kids. Yeah. So if I'm an inspiration to them, uh, they are my inspiration to inspire them. So without them, I'm nothing. You know, without players, coaches are just like normal people, I would say. So thank yeah. you for supporting us. Hunter has been with us for like, I don't know, four or five years. He's devoted to futsal. He will, uh, you know, choose futsal over any other sport. He uh, loves it. So, and we are like developing more of those players that are choosing just to play futsal uh, yeah. rather than football. But then we hit the wall. Where's the pathway? Okay, so you have the passion there, but you don't have the pathway. That passion will die. Yeah. Very good, Vinny. Um, for those joining us now, uh, my name is Hannah Fenrick, and I'm talking, having the pleasure to talk with my great friend Vinny Lecce uh, about futsal and everything related to it. Um, please feel free to send us any comments, any questions that you may have, uh, and we'll try our best to address them as we as we go. Uh, you know, here just quickly. Hi, yeah. Nikki. Hi, Alex. Hi, Richard. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think uh, Paul Tuluk it was here as well. Josh, Lucinda. Yeah, we'll try and say hi to you know uh, all of you guys. At least mention your name. So you and feel sorry like, in advance if we so, miss anyone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I'll, I'll try and go back. So that's why I'm looking away sometimes. Yeah. Uh, just to see who is joining us, so we can acknowledge that. Very good, Vinny. Um, yes. We have created together a few years ago um, the NSL, the Northern State League, and it has been growing and it has been so successful and it has offered a pathway for our kids, something to aspire, something to play uh, at and um, for our academies to, to be alive and for the kids to train with purpose and, and you know, focus in, in the competition. Um, last um, year, we had the, the, the opportunity to have uh, Mick Day and the East Coast Eagles to join us. We had Galaxy FC from Gold Coast. Uh, we've been in talks with the Crusaders from Gold Coast. Uh, and that's, uh, that's run through winter. So North Coast Futsal and Just Futsal uh, run the NSL through winter when football is on. So um, I personally, you know, considering considering everything that we have already spoken um, about, I think it's an achievement for, for where we are uh, to have such an amazing competition, an amazing league, and, um, and, and, and to offer something like that for, for our kids here in the region. Because, um, you know, a lot, a lot of the times people have come to me and said, um, 
you know, kids in the country, they miss out on a lot of opportunities. So they're, um, they're deprived you know, com compared to the city kids. Sorry to interrupt you. Compared to the city kids, we are deprived of opportunities. Yes. So we can go to a corner and cry about it. Going, yeah, there's no opportunities. I'm not going to do anything. Or we can do something about it, which is to join forces like we did initially uh, to create the Northern State League, which was just the two of us. Remember, actually started as academy challenges. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Remember? It was Excuse just me and you, North Coast Futsal and Just Futsal Academy Challenges once every two months, you know. Uh, let's go and play against each other. One round in Grafton, the other round in Canelaba. And then we saw, okay, we can actually join, like ask more clubs to join us because we have something, uh, it's a good format, but it needs to grow. So then we uh, got Nick and Allison from Port Macquarie, they joined us. So we opened our third club, joining the Northern State League. If you want to talk about that, you can. Otherwise, I'll just, you know, interrupt you all the time. <laughs> that's all right. That's all right. Um, so the the NSL is um, is is what we created, and we continue to improve. Unfortunately, Vinny, um, I think you shared the same concern um, with the NSL for 2020. Um, we we don't know what's going to happen just yet, so uh, we won't we won't say anything just yet, yes or no. But um, it's still um, very much alive in, in our plans, unless we are told that we cannot have it. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's something that you know we can't control. It's out of our hands. Uh, we're ready for it. We had prepared for it. Kids were excited. The parents were excited about it. I was as well. But uh, I think there's, there's, you know, um, worse things to worry about now, which is the okay. futsal season. You know, the NSL is an important tournament of our, for our academy players. Uh, but if we can get the summer season, okay, uh, happening, that's going to be, uh, that's going to lessen the pain of not having another state league. But if this, uh, you know, crisis continues to go on and affects the futsal season, then that's that's going to be heartbreaking for all of us. So the Northern State League will come back stronger next year. Uh, we'll, we'll try and, you know, uh, organize something, maybe a shorter version of the Northern State League instead of going for five, six months, you know, one round a month. Yeah. Uh, we can con condensate that in, you know, two weekends. Uh, it can be very flexible. We, we yeah, of each month up. we go, great, three rounds only, one in Port, one in Grafton, one in Ganelba, you know, maybe October, November, December. Uh, for the academy players that were registered, you know, uh, and then we can adapt. Yeah, that's what everybody will have to do now uh, with this crisis is to adapt. So the, you know, it's the, it's what the, you know, the, the best players and the best clubs do. They adapt to the reality. So the yeah. reality now is the crisis we're in at the moment. So we need to adapt, be smart and adapt. Absolutely agree. Uh, Vinny, you did uh, you did play for a few different clubs here in Australia, and um, you, you went with teams to to play in Asia before uh, in, yeah. in different countries um, at um, o OFC, um, and was it AFC and OFC? Was it a as a player AFC as a coach OFC? Yes. Can you tell a little bit more? about your experience in Asia and um, how we know, we know that the, the Socceroos, for instance, they, they play in Asia. So the football people, the football lovers are used to, you know, to see what's happening in Asia, but what, what's happening with futsal in Asia? Are they very much far ahead of us? Are they close to us? How professional are they? Can we get there one day? <laughs> um. I just want to say hi to Chantel. Thank you for, uh, you know, allowing me to coach Dylan. Great, great player, great character, great attitude. So he'll, he'll go very far in life. Uh, <laughs> Lucinda as well. Thank you for supporting Futsal. Hunter's a quality player and hopefully he can stay with us. Uh, hi, Nick and Diogo watching us. Ian. All right. So answering your question. As I said before, for those that have been watching since from the beginning, uh, my career here as a coach was more like 70 percent as a, uh, my career in futsal here in australia was based more as a player so 70 percent as a player 30 percent as a coach those 30 percent is due to being able to coach once a month yeah so i had a lot of spare time so i was training playing football locally here 
but uh, in 2000 and I think 12, sorry if I'm not mistaken, 2012, uh, the National League has started in 2011. So that's when I got involved. So in two, 2012, I've been invited by one of my friends, Gianni Romano. Uh, you may know him from My Kitchen Rules. So uh, he's and his wife there. Sorry, there's a mozzie here. Uh, apologies. So he uh, invited me to go and play for a club in Melbourne called Melbourne Heart. So if you remember Melbourne City, the football club these days, they used to be called Melbourne Heart. Melbourne Heart. So they had a futsal franchise. Okay, don't ask me how that happened, but one guy uh, got got involved with the club and said, "Okay, there's a national league. Do you want to put a team in? Just give us the uniform, you know, lend us the name, and then we'll try and do our best." So he knew Gianni. Gianni knew me. And then he was one of the, you know, the people I met in Brisbane through futsal. Then he said, Vinny, we're going to go to um, play in the National League, which was called Series Futsal. So I think it was uh, every, every three weeks, we, would to, we used to travel to Sydney or Melbourne yeah, to, to play. Uh, Canberra as well, Sydney, Melbourne, Canberra. So we used to go to these you know, three different states to go and play two or three games, two on Saturday, one on Sunday, or one on Saturday, depending on which time you flew into that, you know, uh, state, and then two games on Sunday, and you flew on the same night. So it was not the ideal format, but it was something. So I got involved with Melbourne Heart. From Melbourne Heart, I played for one season, and then the following season, 2013, I've been approached by Thiago Priori, my friend, uh, and Fernando de Moraes, the legend, and then they invited me to uh, join Big Vipers, okay? Uh, Big Vipers was one of the best futsal clubs in Australia. They were playing the National League as well. So they invited me and I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. So I went from Melbourne Heart, which actually finished on that year. They didn't do too well. We didn't do too bad, but we didn't do too well as well. But then uh, the the fundings or the football club was going to that transition, you know, to Melbourne City. So they don't wanna, didn't want to do anything. Uh, they were like, you know, some big financial, you know, trouble. Anyway, I, I don't know what happened. I know that the team, um, they didn't have a team next year. So I went to Vic Vipers, played the 2013 and 14 season. We were crowned the National League champions back to back. And then uh, we went to represent Australia in the AFC. So AFC, for those who don't know, is the uh, Asian foot, uh, Football Confederation, which Australia you know, has joined it. They left Oceania, OFC, uh, to go to AFC. So over there, the first year we went to uh, China, and then uh, funny thing is that I went there as a player, but then I didn't know anything about international clearance. So we were training there, playing some friendly matches against some Chinese clubs, and then I could not play. So uh, half an hour before the game started, you know, this guy from FIFA came and said, okay, that guy, who is he? And he goes, oh, Vinny Leite from Brazil. Go, I want his international clearance. Just a funny fact for people to know. And then yeah. anyway, they just pulled me out, didn't let me play the tournament because I didn't have an international clearance. It's a, it's a letter that you need to get from your uh, local football federation back in your country saying that you, you're not uh, contracted to any club, you're a free agent and you can play. So it's funny because uh, it runs out of two years. If you're living overseas and you have no contact with your former club, uh, your contract ends. So you're a free agent and you can play. But they, for some reason, wanted that letter. Okay, because we're playing against Nagoya Oceans. So I don't know if they were threatened, you know, by me, because we had Fernando Thiago, Vitor Browner, myself, you know, Johnny Adam. We had a very good squad. Chris was in goals, had a very good squad. And then they felt like, oh, this Brazilian guy, they imported him, you know, he's contracted to Brazil, he can't play. So I was devastated. Yeah, so I went there with high expectations, trained really hard, and I could not play. So I, would, I had to sit on the sidelines and watch. But Talking about the tournament, it's unbelievable. So you had the champions of, you know, uh, China, Japan, Australia, uh, and other countries in Asia, you know, Thai, uh, Thailand, was that Thailand? Uh, I don't know, uh, Bank of Beirut, you know, from Libya. So it's it was an amazing tournament. Yes, amazing tournament, very professional. All clubs in that tournament were professional clubs. Players were getting paid and that's what they did for a living. Yeah? They are training twice a day, six days a week. Australians, you get lawyers you had doctors you had dentists you had you know uh, truck drivers you had uh, brokers you know playing futsal at nighttime so how can you can compare so the results were not 
ugly results, if I can say, but we did not stand a chance. Yes. And yeah. fasting forward, you know, over the years, as you asked me, how is futsal overseas? It's the word I'm going to say here, and I use that quite a lot and people know, is that Australia is the only country I've been to or that I know that disrespects futsal. Yeah. What Australian, the federations or the people that, not the people that run it because they love it, but the federation disrespects the sport. Yeah, there's so many potentials, so many talent out there, so many opportunities, uh, and they're depriving the kids and the parents from it. Yes, so the kids are growing old and not getting the, the opportunities that they d deserve, but they still demand and charge the fees, the FFA, you know, the so registration fees if you are an affiliated club, and uh, they offer little in return. So I'll mention that again. Australia, in general, disrespects futsal the way they're running it here. So, but that comes from the football clubs and the football coaches. Yeah? So they, it, it has gone much better over the years. And then people are going to criticize me for saying that. But I say to, you know, uh, to, to people's face and the coaches as well, uh, they don't know much about futsal. So they tell the kids first, it um, teaches you to be selfish because, you know, it's a small area. You, you get the ball, you don't pass. You just go for one-on-ones. That's, you know. Uh, a mistake they're making by saying that they say that futsal it's bad for your joints you know the hard surface is going to hurt your knees hurt your ankles it's not good for it the sharp turns you know the stop and running all the time it might tear your tendons so that's 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 bad and uh, they stop kids from playing because to be honest their biggest fear is to allow them to play because once they do it they fall in love with it. I've had so many kids last year in my futsal season coming for the first time to play futsal from football. After many years, I'm begging them to play, begging, oh, come please play. And then he goes, oh, my, my dad allowed me to play. Or the parents te texted me saying, oh, my son has been, you know, uh, talking to me to allow him to play futsal. I'll let him play. And then the first comment they make after playing their first game is, wow, this is so much better than football. Okay, so that comment speaks for itself. I don't need to go into much detail, but uh, that's that's the fear the football coaches have. If they allow the kids to play, or if they encourage them to play, they're afraid to uh, lose them, and that's the biggest issue here. So that's why Australia disrespects the sport because they don't allow or encourage the kids to play. Uh, it's the lack uh, of knowledge, isn't it, Vinny? The lack yeah, of knowledge but, and the fear and the ego and the politics. Well, and I wouldn't say lack of knowledge because they know how important futsal is how beneficial futsal is for well, them. i mean i mean the ones player. sorry to interrupt i mean the ones yeah. who tell the kids that only teach you you know to be selfish and only teach you to to um it, it tells them that they're gonna get they're gonna hurt their knees and all that so these are lies and 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 i can i the only reason I can think of is the lack of knowledge. I don't know how and where they got them from or if they came up with it. So, But that's untrue that um, you're going to hurt your knee playing futsal, that you, futsal teaches you to be selfish and, and et cetera. And we can go uh, much deeper into that if we wanted to go. But um, I guess, you know, enough said on the, on the subject. <laughs> yeah, no, as I said, it, it might be a, ne a lack of knowledge but it also might be the only excuse they have, you know? Sure. Sure. So, what are, so what are they going to say? Uh, don't play because, uh, because, uh, because I don't want you to. So they need to come up with these uh, lies or, uh, you know, ideas to put in the, in the, in the parent's head. Oh, my son's got to get injured. It's not good for him. Uh, and if you want to go beyond some coaches uh, in the region, we, we had it here, had it here. We don't have it anymore. But we had, People just saying, threatening the players to say, if you play futsal, if I catch you playing futsal, I'll kick you out of the program. So it's it was very hard for the kid to join the football program, yeah. you know, the elite football program in the region. And then once they got in, they were like, you know, amazed by it. But the then they... program, the program that, by the way, he doesn't get paid for. He, the parents, spend thousands of dollars, yeah. and then they get told that their child cannot do other sports. So. But it, yeah. Do. But yeah. But then they, they, you know, uh, touch the the wound. We say, you know, in Portuguese, and it makes sense. So they, they, they know how to threaten the player. Mm -hmm. so if you go, you, you lose your spot. So there's another hundred kids wanting that spot. So he goes, okay, I'll say no to futsal. And that goes back to what I said. That is a dis disrespect to futsal, because 
we should be working together. But then I heard it from, I think, Salucinda said that so one day. If football clubs cannot incorporate futsal into their program, at least cooperate. Yeah. So if you can't incorporate, at least cooperate. Uh, it, it's much better now. I don't want to be that you know harsh and just mm-hmm. be negative about it. It is much better. And a sign of that is to see that you have Brisbane Raw, an A-League club having a futsal franchise, you know, starting futsal uh, teams. Uh, Gold Coast United, one of the most respected, you know, NPL clubs in Australia, not just in the Gold Coast or Queensland area. They have a futsal partnership. Yes, I was coaching there with Galaxy, Andrew Parks from Gold Coast and Armando. So they started a futsal partnership, a futsal franchise. So the football players can go and play futsal without being told not to. Uh, you got Glenn Boyd as well from so Crusaders. So he gets most of the Gold Coast players to go and represent Crusaders. That's why they're such a successful futsal club. Absolutely. And Gold Coast is such a successful football club because they're working together. Then you have Lions FC, first year doing the, uh, the Gold Coast International Cup. So Lions FC, another NPL club in the top six, they're doing futsal with Marty Calvert doing an amazing job uh you know so thing, things are starting then you have logan lightning in brisbane as well with half of he's trying to get a partnership with them so the football clubs are waking up to the fact that okay so i can't say lies or i can't stop the kids from playing because they're playing anyway uh you know so we yeah. may as well just join forces or allow them to play and you know get the most we can from this partnership so they're looking for now futsal, futsal clubs or futsal people to be associated with so they can get the players to go and uh, train futsal and play as well. Because it goes back to what I said before as well, disrespecting. So if the clubs truly care about their players, they would not get them and develop them for only six months. Yeah, the football season goes from March, February, let's say to September, six to you know seven months. What happens to the other five or six months of the year? Yeah, see you later. I'll see you guys in February again, come and pay your fee. Why not say, okay, guys, the football season's finished in September. Okay, go and play futsal for our club. So you keep them engaged in your club if you had a futsal franchise or recommend, refer them to go and join, uh, you know, so fast feet, go enjoy like elite foot, go enjoy just futsal, go enjoy North Coast, go enjoy, you know, East Coast, uh, Galaxy, you know, all these clubs, Gold Coast Force, go and join these clubs, go there, play for another four or five months. I know the parents might sign, oh, we, we don't have a money tree in our backyard. But that can, you know, the, the fees can be negotiated, payment plans available anyway. But then if the clubs truly cared, as I was saying, they go, go and play. So the kids develop themselves for 11 months of the year, possibly, you know, 12. They need a break and they get a break from, you know, 18th of December to uh, beginning of January when the tournaments, you know, so resume. Mm-hmm. So, but the clubs do what? Especially in my region here. Not don't play futsal, don't do it. So they... Do they actually care for the development of the players or they care about retaining the players because they mean their fees? So they're like, you know, um, dollar bills running around the field. Yeah. What, what, do, what are they actually doing? Developing the players, wanting to develop the players, wanting to retain them so they mean money. It would make much sense. Um, Glenn uh, from Crusaders and Gold Coast did mention that um, just before that it happens on the Gold Coast too. Um, so it is. It is a an issue, unfortunately. So Sam just just Glenn, that. Can, sorry, Glenn. Can you just say what happens on the Gold Coast? Like coaches telling kids not to play futsal, or telling those lies we mentioned before that it's bad for your joints, teaches you to be selfish. Uh, you know, um, there's other things here. You know uh, that coaches say about futsal. What exactly uh, happens? Um, yeah. Can Can you actually just specify? For us, what actually happens? Uh, I think hi, a lot Tony. Of can relate to that as well. Um, hi, Tony. Hi, Trevor. Reza, Alakbar, uh, Jessica, Miku, Sam. Hey, guys. Joint partnerships will evolve and develop. Their we have um, we have a, a viewer in Europe. So, a good friend of mine is watching us. Uh, Diogo, you mentioned Diogo. before. Uh, is from I don't Google. even say how to say that that country Lu- in English. How do you say? Is it Lux- Luxembourg? Luxembourg. That's I've never guess. said that word before. I've <laughs> never said that word. There, so we say talk. Luxembourg. Luxembourg. <laughs> so uh, moving on, Vinny, I think uh, we sort of um, have got a little bit 
further past what we planned, but I think people are enjoying because they're sticking around. And for that, thank you so much, everyone who's watching. If you're joining now, if you just went out quickly and then came back, because we, uh, we we just want to say that we really appreciate you um, being with us. Uh, if you haven't yet um, put a comment there, just even if it's just a hi or a little wave, or and, and don't forget to hit that um, like button for us. Um, Apolog apologies for you know speaking too much, guys. I know uh, it's one of my uh, flaws, but you know uh, I think I got you know too confident with my English that uh, what I didn't. <laughs> so what I didn't speak in the first two three years of my you know journey in Australia, um, I saved up for the last you know three years. <laughs> you won't have to to use uh, body language in this live. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Imagine get injured. No. <laughs> So, uh, Vinny, just um, on the subject of um, coaching and playing overseas, let's move to a different continent now. Um, you had the, the opportunity to go to, to South America with um, FAF. Yep. Tony Cifuentes and Marty Carver and the, the Australian squad. And I saw your photos. We, we spoke about that in a, at a barbecue and then um, obviously... Um, it was a great experience, but um, how does how does Argentina compare to to Brazil, our home country? How do they see futsal? It's just as big. Um, they are current currently uh, world champions. Um, so what 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 were your thoughts there at the AMF uh, Futsal World Cup? Yeah, so I've been invited by Tony. He's the president of the FAF Futsal. Uh, yeah, Futsal Federation. Now, hang on. Futsal. No, Federation of Australian Futsal. Apologies. Right. Federation of Australian Futsal. Uh, he's he's actually doing something great for the sport. Yeah, I know it's different rules, so it's throw-ins instead of kick-ins, but that's just one small detail uh, compared to what other people are doing. Okay, so he invited me to go to with the senior team, be Marty's assistant coach, uh, and I did not hesitate. I said yes because I knew it would be an, uh, an amazing experience. And then just talking about that quickly before I go into my experience over in, in Argentina is that, apologies, um, Tony now has the pathway through AMF to uh, send Australian teams to compete on the international level. Yeah? That's something Australia doesn't have. FFA doesn't have. All the futsal organizations are trying to do it or they do it but it's not the legitimate okay and the right pathway but Tony now uh, is doing it so we just went over with the uh, senior team to Argentina and then the under 13s last November I think Guy that's watching us he went to Spain with the under 13s to uh, the under 13s World Cup yeah the AMF World Cup which is very similar to FIFA which FIFA doesn't have it anyway FIFA has nothing for juniors Okay, so you have in Australia, okay, just doing the links here, a lot of players that can afford to go to tournaments uh, are talented, okay, uh, are hungry for opportunities, but then they don't get them. Okay, so now Tony comes and then does that. So I think he's on the right track and uh, I'll help him as much as I can, you know, with uh, coaching or providing players to, to go and attend these tournaments. But going back to what you asked, Argentina, amazing. Yes, amazing. So uh, I never, I had never been to like Argentina. They are like our hermanos, you know, biggest rivals uh, in football, not in life, just in football and in futsal as well. But just going there just validated what I thought about South America in general. Okay. So over there, AMF is bigger than FIFA futsal. Okay. So they, one guy was posting so the other day uh, at the uh, futsal Japan page that they have uh, five divisions in the AMF. So each division with, you know, eight to 10 teams, that's only in Buenos Aires, okay? And for FIFA, they have three divisions. So therefore, AMF is much bigger. But the level of organization, uh, the stadiums, they were packed. For those who are watching this live and then were there with me, like Dane Stokes was, was there, uh, not, not Dane, uh, Elliot Brown was there, Many others, I haven't checked the, the names here, but for those who know what I'm talking about, it was an amazing experience, okay? It was similar to going to a FIFA World Cup, which I've been to one as well, and I'll talk about it later. But the AMF, uh, you know, Senior World Cup, it was unbelievable. Police escort, you know, uh, interviews, and the stadiums, amazing. 
amazing. If I could share some photos or videos uh, with you guys, that's what I need to work on. You know, I've got photos and videos from so many tournaments that I've been to uh, as a player and as a coach, and I don't post those videos or photos on Facebook to share with you guys because I think I don't want to expose myself too much or I don't want, I don't know what people are going to think about it, but you, sh you they, should. We, lo we love should, to, to hear about yeah. your achievements. <laughs> I should. So th this is something I promise that I'll, uh, you know, create the, the habit and develop is to go and share. Okay. I don't want to expose my life like this, is what I'm eating for dinner. And this is what I'm having for breakfast. Like some people do, but the, the, the highlights of my career as a coach and player, I'll start doing that. So going back to what I was saying, Argentina, 5,000 people watching the game. Yeah. So we played five games there, including, uh, actually seven games including two friendly matches the friendly matches had an average of like four four hundred seven hundred people just a friendly match on a tuesday night yes in the heart of buenos aires so 700 people they brought flares in flags balloons so i felt like i was in at the stadium la bombonera yeah the futsal stadium because i was like what the hell is like tuesday night you know a friendly match against an australian team that nobody knows some people don't even know well, where australia is like on the world map but they heard the word futsal, they went there to support their team. So 700 people on a Tuesday night with flares, balloons, flags, chanting yeah. their team, supporting them. I went, wow, if this wow. is a friendly match, I wonder what the actual, the World Cup games are going to be like. Mm -hmm. And that said, you know, it exceeded my expectations. 5,000 people, 7,000 people on the opening game, Australia versus Argentina. Uh, we lost the game. I'm not going to say we got smashed because we, we tried really hard. And the second half we actually won. I think it was 4-2 to us, but the first half was 8 new. So the final score was 12-2, I think. But just the experience, you know, it goes back to what I said. The exposure, the experience was amazing. Then we had some a great game against Italy. Uh, we lost 6-5. Then we lost to uh, South Africa 4-2. Uh, all, these, all these countries that I'm mentioning that we played against, they are professional players. Yeah, the players get paid to play futsal. So Italy, they all play in the FIFA uh, leagues over there, Serie A or Serie B. Uh, in Argentina, that's what the players do. Okay, They don't leave work at 4 p.m. and then come to a game at 7 p.m. They are professional players. Australians, what are we? Engineers, dentists, yeah. you know, truck drivers. Uh, <laughs> like so that's the other. thing, yeah. That, that's the thing. Like, you cannot compare. It goes back. And, yeah, it goes back to what I said. It, it, it is a disrespect not to the sport now, but to the players to put them against you know, professional players, but I think they, they like the experience and they can't afford it and they should do it because I don't regret a moment of going to Argentina. It was amazing. What Tony did, the program, you know, on and off the court, it was amazing. The hotels we stayed in, the like accommodations, everything was perfect, perfect. Uh, for the under 13s as well, Geek can post something about uh, where they stayed, you know, how the tournament went. I know they beat France 6-4, the under 13s, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and went through to the quarterfinals, but then got smashed. Uh, to so Uruguay that ended up winning the tournament, but they're like much bigger and the players do more futsal than us. But anyway, the opportunities are there. Argentina was amazing. Like seriously, I will not hesitate to invite me again. And I'm sure the players uh, will do the same, you know, uh, because the opportunities are there, uh, not through FFA, through other like organizations, but if we want to make it better and stronger and, uh, with better outcome for players, you know, in terms of results, that there need to be union, you know, people, uh, clubs, um, federations, organizations, it's whatever you want to call it, they need to join forces. It goes back to what we said before earlier in our life, you know, yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, a game absolutely. of egos, you know, game of thrones, you know, we, <laughs> so which king is going to step down? Mm, mm. Um, Vinny, uh, Glenn from Crusaders um, did um, answer our question there just quickly before we move on. Uh, let's address that. For example, outdoor um, SAP clubs have possibly three nights a week training with two coaches and 24 players. Uh, why not put one of those nights into futsal uh, with more contact time per player? Oh, that is such a good point, Glenn. And, and um, I'll speak for myself, but and I'll let Vinny make his point as well. I think um, I, I truly believe that if if there was a way that we could incorporate that as in, in um, not as a suggestion or who, who wants to do does it, uh, but if we, if, you know, starting with the clubs or starting from the top or whichever way it starts, if we could make it compulsory 
in in a way to in, include in the in the football curriculum for the kids to have at least at least one night a week training of futsal uh, that would make a huge an absolutely huge impact on their development and it, it's been proven uh, so successful um, we, we don't want to you know go too much into this but South America Europe now close to us in Asia everybody's doing it um, so it would make so much sense to have that extra night or to replace one of the nights from, from football uh, for a futsal session and which um, as you mentioned um, the kid the, the child would have so much more contact with the ball there has been um, there has been an article that uh, monitored the number of touches compared um, between a futsal player and a football player. And it found that at times, a futsal player would have touched the ball 415% more times. Uh, I don't know if you've seen this article, Vinny, um, yep. yeah. uh, than, than a football player um, in a group, as you said, at, at, with 24 players. Um, depending on how the activities are set up, it would be a little bit of a, a waste of potential for that training session. Um, if you don't mind me saying, yeah. what what are your thoughts, Vinny? Well, um, I completely agree what uh, you said and what Glenn, you know, wrote. But the thing is, uh, the clubs are not going to give up one night of football to futsal. Okay, they should make the three nights of football as they want to do it because if they do that they say okay we're only going to train monday and wednesdays and futsal can have tuesdays or thursdays or fridays uh, they will see that uh they will be one step behind the other clubs that are not doing it because they're doing three nights of football and we're doing only two and one of futsal even though it's very beneficial but we compete in a football competition so they will think that they're going to be losing one night of training for the for the sport that they're going to be competing in which is football but then they don't see the bigger picture, yeah? The, the touch on the ball, the, 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 the number of decision makings they'll be, you know, uh, making within that time frame, you know, like the session goes for an hour. But the most importantly is, for example, they should keep the three nights if they can. I know the parents are going to hate it, but if they truly believe that and want that kid uh, to become a professional player, three nights is not enough, you know? You have people in Brazil, in England, you know, in Spain, kids training five nights. You know, yep. uh, and you see how good they are. But in Australia, uh, they because everything is so much easier here compared to where we come from, Hannah. And yeah. we can speak, you know, for that. Uh, in Brazil and most of these South American countries, uh, becoming a professional player means a way out of poverty. Mm -hmm. yeah? So your whole family depends on you. So the mom, the dad, put the pressure on the kid. It's a light pressure, but the kid knows that, okay, I have the responsibility to carry my family now. So he would do eight nights a week if he could, if there was eight days, you know, he would or train, you know, from six to 8 p.m. and then from 10 to midnight. If he couldn't, he would. But in Australia, it starts with the A-League. So the, the Salary, the initial salary, I think is $77,000. So why would a kid, you know, kill himself in the football field to become a professional player and earn $77,000 when he can become an engineer and earn one hundred ten, for example, yeah. or a dentist or any other professional truck driver, you know, gets $100,000 $100, plus. So in Brazil, it's completely different. So a football player earns forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000, let's say, compare to uh, an engineer in Brazil that gets 40, 50, you know? So football players and futsal players in Brazil are gods in Australia, they're not. And then it hits another, you know, um, wall, which is they're not, there are not many clubs, yeah. professional clubs. There's no there, is, there, is a, there is the necessity, isn't it, Vinny? They, they take two or three trans transportations to get to training. They, you know, they, they as you said, they, it's the way out of poverty, you know? And it's the way out of poverty. So they, most they can, of them, most of them will be will be very humble. If you ask a kid that, you know, what's what's your dream? What do you want to do if you become a professional player? They, they probably will say, I just want to buy a house for my parents. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. that's it. So that, that's what they do. As I said, it's a way out of poverty is to uh, give their families, not just mom and dad, but maybe the siblings, you know, uh, better a life. better life, a better yeah. life in Australia. 
they play for status. Yeah, oh, I play for this club, you know, this and that. They have access to the best shoes, the best uniforms, the best training facilities. Look at the oh. fields here. In Brazil, there's hardly grass on our fields over there. Uh, if you're not talking about the, the top you know, clubs, the average club, like the A-League clubs would have the best fields, but the NPL clubs in Brazil would be the, you know, the like suburb teams. They don't have grass. It's like, you know, just dirt, earth, yeah. you no know, red earth. So... Uh, but they still play. So as I said, one is a way out of poverty. The other is for status, you know? Um, and then, so going back to, to what we're saying about the Sunday nights, so the club could say, okay, three nights of football, let's stick to our, you know, training program, which is Monday, Tuesday, and Thursdays. It varies from club to, to club. But let's say Monday, Tuesday, and, and Thursdays, uh, football training, and then let's fit in futsal on a Wednesday night. So they still have Friday off to play on Saturday. Absolutely. Yes, uh, they could do it. I've been asking a local local football clubs, but especially uh, one academy here, so locally, to uh, get a partnership. For example, they have elite and development program. Okay, elite is 14 players per team. Great, so they are considered the best players. They're all there, but they also have a development program that the kids train once a week. Okay, might be on a Tuesday, might be on a Thursday or Friday. Let's say they're training on Tuesday. Okay, just come in, receive the uniform, say they're part of the, the academy and train once a week. Yeah, mm-hmm. they are allowed to play for their football club. So they get another extra night on a Thursday, for example. So Tuesday for the local, you know, uh, international academy and then on Thursday for the local football club. So I approached them many times saying, great, you got the elite players. Okay, and then you got the development players. So they're not in the same level. Okay. How can you get these guys to this level to keep the competition and the pressure on these guys so they keep pushing themselves to achieve more? They go, oh, no, we, we do challenges, you know, in-house friendly match. And I go, great. Can you give me your best 40 development players? Okay, let's divide them into 10s, 12s, 40s. Yeah, so let's say, give me 45, 15 on the 10s, 15 on the 12s, 15 on the 40s. Okay, I'll coach them on a Friday night. Yes. Futsal on a Friday night. So they'll be doing Tuesday with you guys, Thursday with the football club, Friday with me. They'll get the same three nights as the elite players. Okay. And then at the end of six months, those development players will be more developed than they were if they were only training once a week. And then next year, they can feed your elite club. If one player from your elite, which is happening a lot, going to Gold Coast United, going to Brisbane Raw, going to Gold Coast Knights, they're leaving the club because they seek better opportunities. So as soon as you lose that player, there's a hole in your squad. Where are you going to go? You can wait for more players to join in, or you can you can go in your own club and get the best development player that has been doing futsal, okay, and football to fill that spot. But then they go, no. Okay, so can they do it? I don't know. But if they could, would they do it? Maybe not, because they don't want to allow players to play futsal. So it's, it's just hard to answer that question yeah. because I don't know what they're, they're thinking, but if I was them and I truly cared about my players, uh, for the development of my players, uh, I would just say, okay, just go and do it. They're not going to be losing any money. They are actually just going to get benefits out of it. So the yeah. kid's not going to get worn out because it's not four nights or five nights. It's just an extra night of futsal. We will, uh, continue, to be, we will continue to offer them to build a bridge, won't we? <laughs> yeah, so and the, kid can, the kid can compete in the futsal uh, competitions that we have and then when they return next season okay they can try out for the uh the elite academy but the funny thing is they say no to this yes but they don't realize that indirect in sorry that's going to be hard to pronounce indirectly uh we have a partnership mm-hmm. because the players that try out for them and then don't get into the elite sometimes they don't want to join the development program so they come to futsal so i spend one year with them sometimes two years they get better they develop then they try out for the elite academy they get in they get in so they go thank you sometimes they say thank you to futsal most of the times they just disappear then they join that squad day so you explain it to me two years ago he wasn't good enough to join your academy okay and you didn't you offered him the development opportunity he said no so he got forgotten but then the player had the passion and the desire to succeed and, and the motivation to get into that squad. He looked for the options and the option was futsal. Then he developed for one year, two years, sometimes three years, get into the elite academy. So what made that player develop? Was you saying no to them and then he just sat at home and somehow, you know, uh, 
So technique, you know, uh, speed, balance fell on his lap and go, great, I'm ready. Or he went after options. That options foot so and it's just around the corner. And if more clubs adopted that, yeah, retain your elite players, but then develop the development, you know, level players. You know? Yeah. Uh, I think that that could be a start. Yeah. And then as they see results through the development players, go, they're actually improving. Wow, amazing. Futsal competitions, uh, representing your club as well, keeping them engaged with your club. Uh, then they could return next year and then you produce better quality players. So instead of having 14 elite players, you could have the 14 and another five joining in. So mm-hmm. out of a sudden you have 20 for 14, uh, you know, uh, spots. So great go, suggestion. Great suggestion. I think it, it would be definitely a viable option for them to, to look at. But Vinny, I've let's try uh, many times, but no, it's not. It's not. <laughs> let's uh, go into the last part of our uh, broadcast now. Um, just wanted to say, guys, that we appreciate so much you sticking around with us. Uh, we've got so much to say and so much to talk about and discuss some, some really, um, really deep t- uh, issues to, that concern the futsal uh, world and the futsal people in Australia. Uh, and um, so we just wanted to say that we are really, really happy to, to have you here. Don't forget to send us a comment, say a hi, or hit that like, or show us our love with the little heart button there, and share this with anyone that you think might benefit from from listening to what we have to say. Now, um, if you stick around to the end, I have a little surprise question for Vinny that's not on the script. <laughs> You're putting me on the spot here. Uh, it's going to be fun, guys. It's going to be fun. So stick around. Don't go anywhere because there's a surprise question that's not on the script um, to, to see what, how Vinny is going to react to that one. <laughs> Vinny, uh, just um, last year, you were appointed as the Solomon Islands national coach for futsal. Um, I can only imagine that was uh, such an honor for you and uh, I just wanted to know how did that opportunity um, come about if you wanted to if you could tell us um, how it happened and and tell us a little bit about your work there I know you have Alex with you there uh, and the boys are preparing well and then he recently um, played in Asia and and qualified for the World Cup so just run us through and talk Talk us through um, your experience in the in the Solomon Islands. Oh, the the first contact I had with them was in 2015. So Giuliano Schimeling, friend of mine, he, uh, pro, he we worked together at Galaxy. So I was a player, he was a coach. So we got to know each other. So uh, he was appointed as the Solomon Island uh, head coach, and then they had the OFC qualifiers for the 2016 FIFA World Cup in Colombia. Uh, it was in Fiji in January. So when he took over, I think it was September, October of the, the year 2015. So I go, Vinny, can you help me? And I go, yes, how? Uh, okay, so I need to take them to Australia for a training camp. Can you help me out? And I go, yeah, I, I can try and put a tournament together for you. That's how I created the, uh, the International Cup. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's, that was played in December. We had a good run, 2015, 16, 17, uh, three years. You know, it was pretty pretty good tournament. 18 as well, sorry. It was an amazing tournament. We and then they one. came here. <laughs> huh? We played in one. Yeah, no, it was, it was pretty good. International size court, you know, uh, high yeah. level. We love it. Cash, love it. Cash prize was amazing. So they came in 2015 to Lismore, stayed here uh, and played in that tournament. So Peter from Futsal Loss supported us, sending three teams, actually Bowing, I think Carlton and Fitzroy, okay, from uh, Jimmy Sufis and Nando. Uh, so they came over here, played the tournament. The following year, you know, in January, uh, they had the qualifiers and they qualified for the FIFA World Cup, which was, uh, I think, in July of the same year, 2016. So I was like, oh, great. I helped them. I felt really, you know, uh, happy for them for uh, achieving their goals. They wanted to go to the World Cup. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. So Juliana one day brings me up saying, Vinny, uh, you helped us, you know, we didn't have much time to prepare. That tournament really helped us, gave us, uh, you know, uh, what, what we needed leading up to that qualifiers, something that we, we would not get if we uh, didn't come to Australia. So I would like to return the favor. And I go, yeah, like how? I want to invite you to join us, uh, our coaching staff, to go to the World Cup. And I go, 
are you kidding me? Are you so for real? He goes, no, I want you to be, I only have one position available, which is the goalkeeper's coach. And I go, I'll, I'll do it. So the title was a goalkeeper coach, but he had Jerry Sam as his assistant coach. And then I joined in, in as a in second assistant coach, for example. Mm-hmm. Uh, then that's how my involvement, you know, started with the Solomon Islands. So we went to the Colombia in 2016 uh, and also an amazing experience going to a FIFA World Cup, staying in the same hotel as Falcon, you know, the, the Spanish team, uh, the Argentinian team that ended up winning the World Cup. They stayed in the same hotel as us, uh, seeing all the, you know, reporters, journalists, the yeah. famous players that you only saw on TV, uh, they were just there next to you having dinner, you know, next to you. So you go, wow, this is like the top, this is the, the highest, you know, you can get in futsal. So I achieved the dream that many players and coaches have, which is to go to World Cup. I could never go as a player, uh, but going as an assistant coach, the title doesn't matter. You know, even if I went there as a, you know, uh, ball boy, you know, water boy, didn't matter. I went to World Cup, oh, yeah. you know, uh, it was an amazing experience. So 2016 is a, a year that I'll never forget. And I thank Giuliano for the opportunity of a lifetime he gave me. So, uh, yeah, so that, that was it. So 2016 World Cup, Colombia with the Solomon guys, got to know them, got to know their culture. Uh, I knew how poor they were, but I never had contact with them. And I knew how humble they were, how devoted, devoted to God they were. Um, yeah, how much faith they had. And it was just a pleasure, an honor, and a privilege, okay, to be involved with them. So if I could share that with you guys, uh, what I what I you know experience with them on and off the court, you know, it's unbelievable. You know, from players that can only have two meals a day, they have to choose: do I have breakfast today and dinner? Do I have breakfast and lunch, or do I have dinner, uh, lunch and dinner? So they have to choose. Okay, so uh, yeah, it's just and to compete at the world stage. So that's something to you know to really uh, praise them for because they are warriors they're not just players you know they're war- warriors of life mm. Mm. yeah that's so, it 2016 so, um, so then then last year you started as in an official position as as the national coach and um what, what's yep. been happening since so then juliano left juliano went to uh fiji to be uh no oh, school sorry Tahiti to be the national coach there. And then Jerry Sam, which was the assistant coach, took over. But then he got offered the position to go to Papua New Guinea with football, paying good money. So the Solomons had no coach. So they go, oh, we had that Vinny guy. He helped us, you know, he showed us some some drills. Uh, He helped us not just going to the World Cup, but at the World Cup as well. So I've been, I was approached by Elliot uh, Ragomo, which is the captain, saying, Vinny, do you want to be our coach? I was in Brazil at that time. I was in December, okay? Uh, and then he rang me saying, Vinny, do you want to be our coach? And I go, what? Be what? The coach of what? Like the, the local comp? He goes, no, the Kuru Kuru, the national team. We need a coach. Uh, we need to appoint somebody. The media is pressing us, blah, blah, blah. And you are the first name that came up in our head. I think 11 people had applied for the job, but then they went after me because I knew the squad and they didn't have much time so i go let's do this yeah i'm i'm happy so i went i was in brazil december of 2018 and then 2019 i took over which was last year then i brought my coaching staff with me which is just one which is alex and then we went to solomon islands uh in i think february or march uh for a training camp there so for 14 days two weeks so we went there and when we got there, everything that I imagined about Solomon, it was uh, that plus more, okay? So the, the poverty, you know, the lack of uh, infrastructure on everything, the stadiums, you know, uh, the heat is so hot there, the mozzies are everywhere. Uh, but then the the passion for, for futsal, you know, was much bigger than expected. I knew how big it was, but then it was much bigger. Then Alex and I implemented the, the two... Uh, two training sessions per day. Is that something they, they, they were not used to? So then we got in conflict with yeah, the bus, you know, uh, allowance. They only got one allowance a day to go to one training session, but we wanted to train twice because we wanted to maximize our program within those 14 days. Uh, and then we got a sponsorship there that allowed them to play, to, to come to training twice a day. Uh, the funny thing is they had breakfast and they had dinner. So Alex and I were not 
I'm not saying it just to promote myself or Alex, but we um, helped them with lunch. And their lunch was um, bread, just, you know, plain bread. And then um, some, so what do you guys call the, that little ice poles, you know, thing that, that's frozen. Like so there's a name. Kind of yeah, yeah. Yeah, like a so super duper. That was their lunch. So yeah. they're coming to training with a breakfast and then training. So training was from 10 to 12. And then the afternoon training was three to five. Some didn't go home because they lived too far away and they wanted to keep the bus fair. So they slept at the stadium for three hours. But then that lunch we gave them was three or four uh, loaves, you know, of bread, you know, the bread mm -hmm. and the super what? Zupa super dupas. Yeah, super dupas. Uh, that was their lunch. A bit of sugar I and a bit that's of how it's called. Yeah. yeah, and a bit of a bit of carbohydrates. Yeah, that's what we we did. And then eventually, so the federation started giving them some uh, bread with tuna because they the players were not starting to lose weight, but they mm. felt dizzy in the afternoon. Uh, these are the, the obstacles you know we had to to go through. But uh, we managed to bring them to Australia. You know, fasting forward to the, the program, we brought them to Australia twice. They slept at my shed, the place that I'm in at the moment. So 17 of them slept in here. So once again, I could have shared those photos, the videos of them sleeping here. Uh, they never complained, you know, they're so humble. Uh, they were grateful for being in Australia to, to train. And uh, we managed to qualify for the World Cup. It wasn't easy. It was one of the hardest qualifiers for them. And one of the, uh, the hardest moments for me as a coach, you know. One thing is to coach your academy or a local club. The other thing is to coach a national team. Okay, So you have the whole nation behind you, supporting you uh, if you do well, but they also hate you if you don't do well. So I never put that much pressure on me because I knew how, uh, how capable I was, but it's the results are unpredictable. So you could be the most loved, you know, coach in that nation or the most hated one. And luckily I was, you know, uh, very, very loved when I returned after the qualifiers because we achieved our goal and they're going for the fourth straight World Cup, yeah. so, which was going to be held in Lithuania this year. But it's uncertain, you know, if it's going to go ahead or not. And only time will tell if we'll be able to play this year or not. Most likely that it's not going to happen this year. If it does, teams are not going to have much time to prepare. So it's not going to be a very good World Cup. So I think FIFA will, you know, um, will have to think very carefully if they're going to run it this year or not, which I think, once again, it's going to be postponed to March, February or March next year. Yeah. Traditionally, they've always run in, in the same years as Olympic Games. Yeah. Um, and Olympic Games are now in 2021, so it would more, wouldn't make sense that FIFA would allow the, the squads to um, have a, a better uh, preparation by giving them allowing them more time and, and once this all this mm. health crisis um, pass yeah. you know, once yeah. we're back to normality um, so and then and then so you're just waiting to to find out when um, that's going to happen and do you have any plans to go back there or to bring them here or or not yet well the the plans for this year if we didn't have you know uh, this crisis at the moment, we had a plan to bring them to Australia for another training camp. So we have a better facilities here than going to uh, so to Honiara, Somo. And after you qualify for the World Cup, FIFA gives each team uh, a grant. You know, um, I don't know the exact amount, but mm -hmm. uh, it's some financial support for them to prepare for the World Cup. So they would have a little bit more money to invest in their preparations. So they would come to Australia once. Uh, possibly Lismore and would do pretty much the same program, try and play against some teams on the Gold Coast in uh, Brisbane area. But then we had a tournament, I mean, um, a trip scheduled to go to Japan to play the top three F League uh, teams from Japan and as well as uh, some second division teams, which they're pretty good as well. So we would play, maybe stay 12 days uh, in Japan and try and get five games, at least five to six games. Uh, during that period of time over there. Uh, we're also negotiating to go to um, so Kuwait with my friend Kaka, the coach. We're also trying to go to um, Malta with Damon Shaw. He was there. Or Thailand. Yeah. So some of the Thai teams were uh, willing to play us and accommodate us. But then now, now those options 
uh, are still on the table, but we just need to know when we'll be able to uh, so resume our preparations because at the moment, nobody knows what's going to happen. So the players are training at home. Uh, Alex sent them a program. They're trying to do their best uh, without being able to physically train on the futsal court. Uh, and we just can't wait. So we're going to have to uh, you know, work against the clock when FIFA releases the new dates and we are allowed to train again. So we're going to have to condensate you know, uh, our training, our preparation instead of having 12 months, not 12 months, sorry. Instead of having nine months, 10 months to prepare for World Cup, you might have four months. So we're going to yep. be very careful. Uh, yeah, very careful to how we're going to manage that, you know, to not yep. push the players too hard to the point where they, got, they get injured because uh, they're training too much in a short period of time. And then yep. they get injured, they pull a muscle and then they're out of the World Cup. So we have to be very, very, very careful. Yeah. Very good, Vinny. Um, just wanted to quickly say hi to Chris from the All Abilities. He says he loves listening to us both. <laughs> and um, Mick Day is suggesting you to bring Kuru Kuru again to Port Macquarie. <laughs> Mick, if you invite us, we'll definitely go. We had a great time there. Uh, you, the accommodation was amazing, you know. You sponsored us with a nice hotel, which I forgot the name, by the way. If you want to uh, mess up. Uh, message me the name of the hotel so I can acknowledge their support. Uh, and the, the friendly matches, you know, the venue was amazing. The games were pretty good. The Solomons really uh, enjoyed it. The people, we live streamed the game, so they watched it. It was like overall an amazing experience. And uh, we'll definitely return if uh, you invite us again. When they come awesome. here, you invite us, we can do it. Awesome. All right, thanks everyone um, who have been with us. I prepared a little um, surprise for, for Vinny. I do not mean to put him on the spot at all. I don't like surprises. Eh? <laughs> it's not part of the it's not part of the script, but um, I will try. It's um, apologies if it doesn't work. Hopefully it will. I'll try and share my screen here. Um, Vinny, I wanted to show you a photo um, that I found in your profile um, in in your Facebook profile. Uh, and to, I just wanted you to comment on that photo, what went through your head, what you saw. Um, so let me just see if I can share this with everybody here. So I'm going to hit um, share screen. Tell me if you can see Vinny, because I think if you can, everybody else can. Hang on. Yes, uh, it's still loading. Yeah. <laughs> can you can you see the photo? Yeah. Vinny, I can only imagine what was going through your head, but what was going through your head? Tell us. This must have been a very emotional moment for him, and obviously for yourself. Yeah. Um... Like, as I said, this was probably the, the hardest qualifiers for the, the Solomon. Uh, they, they have like a very offensive and forward style of playing. Uh, it's not very, it wasn't a very structured, you know, uh, attacking system. It was just getting the ball head down, so one-on-ones, maybe some supported plays, but it was more like individually than collective. Uh, and then that's when I came in and try and change that a little bit, uh, getting what Juliana had done, you know, good, and then just improve on that. So there was a lot of pressure because all the other teams were investing more than us, I would say, in their preparations, uh, or at least you were saying that. But I think Solomon invested a lot, bringing them to Australia two or three times. The Federation has done amazing. Sif, uh, William Lai, Leonard, the CEO, uh, they, they did everything they could. You know, they gave us all the, the opportunities to develop the, the players. But the players had that pressure on, you know, after winning three times in a row, um, you know, the, that, so there's a saying, they say, so the, so the, the higher you, you are, so the harder the fall, so, you know, so something like that. So the Solomons were always on top and then to play again in a different format. So before they never had these many teams, they only had, sorry, I'm just going to move here because my leg is going numb. Uh, they only had, <laughs> probably f between five to seven teams each year. So the format was you play each team once and then the, the team with the most points at the end 
qualifies for the World Cup. So you didn't have that group stage format or even semifinals or finals, okay? So this time when they announced eight teams, different format, the players go, oh, okay. I went as well, oh, okay. It, in, in a way, it's a little bit better because you can afford to lose a game in your group stage and still qualify, you know, go through to the semis. But having said that, in the other format, with only seven, six or five teams, if you lose a game and the other teams keep on winning, you can't catch up to them. So you're out anyway, which happened in the previous year with Fiji. So the, the most anticipated game was Solomon versus New Zealand. And I think they played uh, that in the third round. So Solomon beat New Zealand, I think it was 3-1 or 4-1. Sorry, I don't remember the score. Mm -hmm. And then they kept on, kept on winning. So they won against... Tahiti or Fiji, their last games, they qualified. New Zealand was playing after that. So that game pretty much meant nothing. So this format, I actually think it's a little bit better. So the pressure was on. So the players knew about that, you know, and they play for survival as well. You know, they carry their families uh, on their shoulder. So when we um, versed, and because they became better than the other teams and everybody wanted to dethrone them, this qualifies was so much different because every single game, if you watch the highlights, every single game, every single game, teams decided to defend half court. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I knew we would have trouble to uh, break down those, you know, compact defenses because uh, international size court, you know, the, the long range shots are not going to go in uh, despite the quality of the goalkeepers. But I knew we had to have a very organized attacking system with uh, many options to break down those defenses so the pressure I put on the players uh, during the training sessions, preparing them for those moments, uh, not just physically, technically, tactically, but mentally as well. Okay, so Alex was killing them before my session. Okay, physically they were drained, you know, mentally they were drained. And then they still had to train for another hour or two. So preparing them mentally for those uh, moments that we, you know, were anticipating. So every game we started, teams defending uh, half court, sometimes behind the 10 meter mark and just playing on our mistake, okay? Uh, and then just, we won the games, but against the grand final was the same. New Zealand did not attack much. And then they got an early goal, bang, the pressure was on. The first half, if you watch, we had probably five or six chances to score. We did not score. So the pressure was building up. So at halftime, I had to have a, like a, you know, a strong conversation with three of the main players because uh, they're not playing for the team, they're playing for themselves, you know, for the ego, the pride, you know, the status. And then I needed them to play more for the team. So mm -hmm. at that moment, the second half, we had players pulling, you know, they're growing, uh, rolled their ankles. We had two players that morning that were not supposed to play. Our goalkeeper could not, you know, move his arm past the shoulder, you know, level. So mm -hmm. Alex spent 40 minutes with him, you know, working on his shoulder. Uh, Arnold, which is number four, that scored the equalizer within the last 20 seconds. He hurt his knee in the previous game, could not play. So he was crying in the morning when Alex was, you know, uh, working on his knee for about 40 minutes as well. The sessions, which each player was about 40 minutes. So the players were physically, you know, uh, down. Mm -hmm. uh, whether New Zealand, they were like, you know, a little bit more prepared than us because their games... Not that were easier than ours, but they didn't have to spend as much energy as, you know, us. We we're constantly attacking, 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 attacking. We never defended. So, uh, oh, we didn't defend much. So anyway, the players were physically, you know, tired and mentally drained. And then I think they were expecting to, to win because the previous qualifiers was the same. But then considering the early goal and not scoring the first half and going to the second half with the pressure. And then we got the equalized. We go, great. Now we're back to being the Solomons. And then straight away, they got the second goal, 2-1. We go, okay, something's wrong. No, we, we're up against a very strong team. And I knew that with a different style of like defending, you know, uh, and, and attacking. So they, so the New Zealand, you know, they, they evolved, they evolved and improved so much uh, with Marvin. So then we got 2-1 down. We go, okay. Then 2-0. We say, we're we'll back to square, you know, uh, one. Let's let's keep doing it. Straight away, 3-2. And then we go, wow. They defended so well. We could not attack. The pressure was on. The player, the, the legs were heavy. We we're looking at each other going, okay, so what's going on? I I got a little bit anxious and nervous, but I could not pass that on to the player. So I had to keep my cool and go, no, nah, mm -hmm. we, we're going to do this. And I always knew. 
uh, then we decided to use fifth man. We know with four minutes to go, and then we had two or three chances, didn't score, they get the ball, bang, four, two. At that moment, everybody was looking at each other, heads, hands on their heads going, that's it. You know, I looked at the, the clock, there was two minutes and 20 something seconds left. And I go, okay, am I going to be the biggest failure, uh, you know, of their nation being the coach that failed to qualify them? What would my, you know, family think? What uh, my uh, friends in Australia will think? So that movie, you know, played in my head going, okay, so what's going to happen? My losing speech. Hang on, I don't have a losing speech and I worked so hard to win it. So that's not going to happen. At that moment, we had two players out with a growing injury and um, uh, so hamstring injury. So we go, okay, that player that's on the photo, Howie, you know, uh, Ho, he was one of the best players of the competition. He tore his growing, another one, third player. The other one yeah. was uh, Coleman. So Howie tore his growing after scoring the second goal and he was out. So we lost my left footer. I lost my left footer, you know, to cut in and shoot. We go, okay, great. We got Sam Ozifello, another left footer that did not play much the tournament. I said, Sam, you have, you have to go there. So he went there, took, you know, that position, kept his cool, found two, three passes that resulted in the third goal and the fourth goal within two, 20 seconds to go. So the players were so happy. Some were crying on the bench there. Uh, and then, you know, the, the rest is, you know, I saw history. So when we qualified, it was such a, like a relief, you know, uh, a weight off our shoulders because they just didn't have to play uh, through the games. They had to yeah. play through the lack of, you know, uh, food that they had. So doing so sort the of preparation, sleeping in a shed on the floor, not getting their allowances to go uh, to, to the qualifiers. So they could not help their family. So there was pressure on their family as well. And the, the yeah. physical pressure, you know, this, they were injured. So that player, he was crying so much because he worked so hard. But that photo, it's not just about him. All the other players were crying as well. I could not watch the uh, penalty shootout. I, you know, kneeled behind the players on a the corner there with the ball in my hand, looking down. And then I expected for the reaction of the crowd, the ball went in. I was looking up going, yeah, they scored or they didn't. Yeah. But I knew that if we went to penalty shootouts, we would win because we had Talo and our players were so confident, you know. And, yeah. you know, that, that photo translates everything what the preparation was. Sorry for talking too much because there's so much to share, but just talking is it's not enough. <laughs> you, need, you, you need to be here and, I don't know, yeah. Yeah. Ha had spent time with us. But anyway, that photo oh. translates everything. You know, the like sense of achievement, the... Uh, making the family and the nation, you know, proud. I was crying as well. So you can't see my face, but my face is exactly, you know, exactly like his. I was crying because the we achieved our goal and now we could celebrate yeah. and uh, enjoy, you know, that moment because it was a unique moment. You know, it's something that I felt when my son was born, uh, I felt when, you know, we, we won that, uh, that game. So yeah. it was a moment that I'll never forget i'm just talking about it this gave me it's a good <laughs> i can only imagine i it's can only imagine like, then that photo, fifa posted that photo on their pages there and i think it's going around the, the world because it's it's yeah. hard to explain what that photo means you know like people you can you, you can figure that out by just looking at it you know there's so many options yeah that's why i thought i'd ask you that um i hadn't asked that before i saw the photo <laughs> Uh, probably even did, but we didn't go too much into details. Um, and, and thank you for for sharing with us this special moment for for you and, and oh. the Solomon um, players. Yeah, sorry, uh, sorry for speaking too much because yeah, I, I got I don't get emotional uh, by seeing that photo, but it was just like an unbelievable to see that, and you shouldn't have done that to me, you know. Yeah, very very <laughs> nice, Vinny. Thank thank you um, so much for sharing that. No, um, no, I think um, we are heading towards the end now, Vinny. And um, yeah, I can I see yeah, two, two hours and eight minutes. Sorry, <laughs> a little bit, a little bit over what we planned. We won't, we won't say what we planned. <laughs> um, but um, if people wanted to to connect with you um, through social media, what would be the best way to find you? Yeah, just go on our Just Foot So uh, Facebook page. 
uh, and our, on our Instagram as well. So just Futsal New South Wales. Uh, give us a like there. Uh, Dawn does an amazing job uh, looking after our, you know, media content. So she, she does those quotes there, you know, that goes uh, up every Wednesday, I think. Uh, she feeds up with photos, you know, she goes to tournaments. So she looks after the website. Uh, yeah, the web, not, not the website, sorry, the Facebook page and the Instagram page as well. So if you want to find out more about what we're doing, and I promise I will uh, start getting a little bit better in sharing uh, my experiences as, as a coach and as a player, uh, I'll create that habit. I will develop that habit of posting more photos. We just went to so Hawaii, just mentioning that. And only the players that went there with me, eight players know that we went there, for example. We didn't <laughs> post any photos. We played against some amazing Japanese teams, uh, against the two players from Costa Rica that featured in three World Cups. They were there. We played against them. But I never shared anything. So I think I'm a bit silly on that. Uh, but we look forward to um, to seeing those photos and, and possibly yeah, no, videos. Oh, no, I'll, I'll, I'll get better on that. <laughs> Um, for those wanting to, to connect with, with us as well, um, you are obviously watching this video on my uh, page, so Henan Fenrik. Um, so do us a favor and go and hit that like button um, for more you know, interesting content relating to, to football coaching, futsal coaching, all kinds of coaching. We have some special guests um, for live interviews like we're having uh, the the honor to to talk to Vini today tonight. I keep saying today, but it's tonight. <laughs> um, and um, so yeah, just uh, if you can if you can like there and share this, it will be much appreciated. So you can find me at um, at Renan Fenrik on Facebook and also on in Instagram as well. And obviously uh, with the North Coast Futsal um, work that we do here, um, you can find me there too. All right, Vinny, um, any, any piece of advice for our viewers um, that you would like to give? Yes. Uh, keep your kids playing futsal. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, I just, I just want to thank everybody that you know, stayed with us till the end. For those that couldn't but watched a little bit, I uh, just want to you know, thank you all uh, for like, watching it. As I said, it was my first time. Never had experience doing it. I know we went way over the time, but uh, we shared some, you know, great uh, opinions about our sport, you know, the sport we love the most. And um, yeah, sorry for talking too much. I know I do that. My wife tells me that all the time. No but, problem. No problem. I, I can't help it. You know, when talking about futsal, I get even more excited. Uh, and, you know, if, if you don't turn your computer off or your phone off, I'll just keep going till midnight. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> so, no I think, I just want to thank everybody for watching, you know. Uh, so once again, it has been a pleasure. And uh, please give us a like on Facebook, Instagram, and I'll start sharing more photos with you guys so you can follow my journey as a more as a coach now uh, than a player. And then you can follow the Kuru Kuru as well, uh, our journey to the World Cup. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Vinny, once again. Thank you for everyone who um, stayed with us until the end it means the world to us we really really do appreciate it um special thanks to my wife my lovely wife gabby who managed to stay with the two kids so i could do this with you so i love you gabby um <laughs> talita just commenting that yes you do sometimes you know my wife just commenting <laughs> that i talk too much i know i can't help it you know uh <laughs> yeah Yep. Um, and uh, obviously, we will do this again in the future. So probably we'll um, stick with a, in a specific topic and, and bring other coaches in to discuss. Um, yeah. So we can we can continue to build the bridges that we spoke about today, not walls, bridges. So you got some you got, you got some great coaches to invite. You know, Glenn and uh, Mick Day and Bruno was watching here before. Armando Kakachi, you got a lot of experience with futsal here for many years. So this now in, in this time of like isolation, you know, we're at home. So every, not every night, but at least once a week, if you have a, a special guest here, uh, I'm sure people will be, people that love futsal will be, be watching it. I will. And uh, I'll be commenting, you know, but thank you, you, Hanan, for the opportunity. When you invited me, I was a little bit hesitant, as I said. But uh, I don't regret a minute of saying yes to it. I regret, you know, uh, talking too much, but I don't regret doing it. 
<laughs> no, it's my pleasure, Vinny. Thanks for accepting the invitation, and uh, it's been a pleasure. And pleasure. Um, you know, love being a friend and and working alongside with you with our academies and and, and making uh, the a positive impact on on the kids' um, lives. Yep. No, it's, it's a pleasure, man. And I hope we stuck to the uh, title of the uh, live, you know, which is <laughs> beginners to high level. We didn't speak much about beginners. But we spoke about our academies, our programs, what we do for the players. So I think they, they got the idea of what we do to get to that level there, which there is in Australia. One day we will have that. Awesome. Thanks again, everyone. We will um, catch up with you uh, next time. Have a good night. Bye. Thank you for watching.